Welcome to Nick and Dave Deep Dive the Metaverse, a podcast exploring cult classics, subculture, and geek media. I'm Nick. And I'm Dave. And we will be your tour guides for this deep dive of Black Sabbath 1970 seminal proto stoner doom metal album Paranoid. This album is huge, so mm-hmm. I'm really excited for this episode. When I was doing my research on this album, I was actually surprised that it wasn't bigger than it is, because in my life and in my pantheon, <laughs> it kind of reigns, you know, as one of those old uh, albums that influenced everything that I'm into. Yeah, this was, I think, the third or fourth album I've ever bought. Mm-hmm. It's never left my top five albums of all time i've always kind of like this is just went in on on top when i only had five tapes <laughs> and has stayed there uh i wore out the tape bought it on cd nice. and then i bought it again on vinyl since then yeah i had this on cd and then i uh i i went into digital you know mm-hmm. uh podcast or ipod <laughs> hold it whatever yeah. and now of course phones so yeah i've always i've always had this and i i've always really loved this album i was surprised i was actually looking like you know greatest uh selling albums of all time mm-hmm. like and all of that and i was expecting to see this up there with uh metallica's black album but um it it wasn't in there. I couldn't find it. I had to keep scrolling. And it, it's only sold, I say only, it's mm-hmm. only sold about 5 million copies, which is crazy to me. Wow. Yeah. I is. thought it would be, you know, over 20 million, maybe 30 million. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, about 5 million copies. Um, that's and really that's interesting. Yeah. And, and I think part of that is because when it originally came out, it was. Um, A lot of critics in Britain didn't love it. Yeah. They kind of panned it. It didn't get a ton of radio play, but it still rose up in the charts in the United States. Yeah. And so then people had to start start paying attention to it, and it started getting... um, more play and whatnot and so it kind of it had a, it it was more like a grower than yeah, a show a grower that is for sure it well i mean if you compare it to compare it to the black album which i probably it, that's our only other album deep dive we've done so we will a lot yeah we i mean we did a led zeppelin episode but it wasn't really an album yeah that was like of their whole their whole yeah. career but mm-hmm. um it only has two singles on it where virtually everything on the black album got released as at least a radio single at some point. Yeah. I think that that was, it was kind of a different time. I read an interview with Iomi where he said that, um, after they released the, the, um, first single, it got a ton more play. And when they played some shows, there were people actually dancing in the uh, audience yeah. and there was nobody that would dance before that. And so he said he, d- he uh, specifically did not want to release a lot of singles because he didn't want those types of people to get <laughs> into the music. He wanted the original people who got into it. The, yeah. the ones that would stand there and bob their head. Mm-hmm. It, it, what we would now Headbangers. call metal heads. He yeah. wanted the metal heads. He didn't want the posers that mm-hmm. just heard about it. <laughs> Uh, from a single that is pretty funny it's that it's all these things uh you know these sort of subculture uh genres these ideas are baked in like right from jump street this is not for everybody this is a cult thing yeah and and i think that um they they were never trying to. Uh, they were never trying to be super popular. I mean, Geezer who came up, Geezer Butler who came up with most of the like the thematic elements and mm-hmm. whatnot for it. All of it was alternative, like occultism mm-hmm. and that sort of thing, and and none of it was mainstream. And he didn't want uh, this to be something for everyone. He wanted it to be for like. Uh, depressive people yeah, for, and stoners um, for the people like them because it yeah. is it is really they're uh, especially in the early days when they're not successful this is a real gang of losers yeah like factory workers that mm-hmm. smoke weed and drink beer and mm-hmm. um you know are into weird occult shit yeah they read crazy books and <laughs> are interested in the astral pr- plane and all that <laughs> astral projection did you ever try to do like when you were a teen and into stuff like this do you ever try to astral project yourself no i never did i read about it and i was like 
uh, me having the uh, attention deficit, mm-hmm. uh, I can't I can't even meditate. Yeah. So <laughs> let alone try this I, shit. I definitely I had this book called Norse Magic, and it it looked like a cheesy fantasy novel, as mm-hmm. all the sort of as they do pagan books from from the eighties and nineties looked like, and it had like instructions on astral projection. And uh, so I, I'm sure <laughs> like I like a stereo manual. Yeah, like, and I kind of I'm sure I sat down and I I, I lit my my candles and incense mm. and maybe put on some Sabbath or the Doors or something and really yeah. tried to astral project into into the nine realms. But yeah, I never. It just seems like I'm just sitting there imagining going to Asgard or whatever. It yeah. wasn't. It wasn't like I transported myself. Yeah, I've never, I've never <laughs> tried that, but yeah, that's definitely you know Geezer Butler did that. Oh shit, yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, he's, he 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 walked so I could run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the only other thing that really came up to me in for kind of an intro to this album mm-hmm. was, um, again, it was a different era. How ra- uh, record companies had all the power. Oh yeah. Um, like they were forced to change the name of everything, uh, right? And they weren't allowed to cover certain topics. And it wasn't just one record company. It was it was Vertigo in England, and it was Warner in America. Yeah. And they had to basically like serve two masters. And they had to um, to really really alter themselves, their artistic vision, in order to fit this commercial ideal that the record companies wanted. And nowadays, um, that's not really a thing because of self publishing, but also yeah. because because of self publishing, that has made it so that record companies are not as demanding on artists mm-hmm. because artists can simply choose not to use them. Like Trent Reznor self publishing his albums. Yeah. You know, it's like if you have a following, you can make all the money and you don't need the record company. All they offer is PR and distribution. Uh, that kind of struck me too is how little power that they perceived that they had. Yeah. Like they just kind of did as they were told and didn't really fight it. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think they probably could have fought it. Yeah. Um, But they just didn't think they could. Well, they, they kept referencing like, their bar for like, their bar for a rock band was the Beatles. Mm -hmm. Like, and so if the Beatles were doing it, they were like, well, I guess we do it too. Yeah. Uh, I mean, even though they were totally different, um, the idea, but I mean, at this point, you know, late sixties when this is being written and stuff, uh-huh. the Beatles weren't really the same that, you know, the pop band that they were. Yeah. So I, I mean, I think that, um, basically the record company was able to just basically be like, this is how it's done. Mm-hmm. This is how everyone does it. This is how the Beatles do it. This is how you're going to do it. Yeah. And I, they just sort of went along with that. Well, cause they're just lads, right? Like they're working yeah. class lads. Poor as hell. Ozzy doesn't even have shoes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ozzy is such a mess. I, yeah. I just, I've, I kind of fell in love with everyone in the band mm-hmm. like in in the process of this deep dive in, yeah in their own way yeah e- each one has such a i love bands like this where it's characters and yep. each character brings something to the mix and it's it's unique to you know to just the four of them because like uh i love the dio sabbath albums too yeah, they're really good but that's a different band. It's mm-hmm. once you take Ozzy out of it and, and mix Dio in like the, the vibe just changes entirely. And, and a lot, I think a lot of that is because, um, geezer would write a lot of the lyrics and mm-hmm. stuff, uh, and to Ozzy's melodies. Mm-hmm. And then Ozzy would sing them. Whereas when Dio was in the band, Dio wrote his own shit. Yeah. And it's very different. Than yeah. How Ozzy operates. He, yeah. He, he is not like Dio is not going to be told. Here's the <laughs> lyrics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause Ozzy did have that kind of do as you're told attitude in a way. Like they kind of, they approach this in a very arts and crafts kind of way like you're assembling something yeah like he's handed he, he's he's singing nonsense words to make mm-hmm. up a, a melody and then and then geezer is like okay here's here's what i came up with to go with your melody and i was just like oh okay well, whatever let's give it a shot <laughs> you know it's like there's yeah. no ego about it yeah and um i watched another 
documentary that was it came out maybe in the early 2000s it's before black sabbath reunited and everyone's still much more raw with each other so there's yeah. a little more jabbing that goes on and ozzy really like reminisces fondly of those first several years before egos and before um, cocaine got involved <laughs> in things because um when they were really a team he's like he's like, you hold on, you hold on to those early years, man, because you never get that back. <laughs> <laughs> so it's yeah, this time this is uh, when they're at their peak. Yeah, this is kind of golden age Black Sabbath. Do you do you know the term imperial phase? An artist's imperial phase? No, I haven't heard that before. Okay, so this is something. Uh, it came from I think this singer from the Pet Shop Boys coined the term, and basically, huh. an artist's imperial phase is the point where they're at the peak of their creativity and they're doing the work that will define their career forever okay and when you pass out of your imperial phase you might still be making good things but it's never going to live up to what you did in the imperial phase okay yeah i mean that that makes sense like mm -hmm. the ghost in the shell guy yeah who went on to make <laughs> make <laughs> like porn lame, for himself yeah, <laughs> yeah. stuff in the afterwards yeah I, I can definitely see how this is true like i i think like metallica's imperial phase is master of puppets well it's you know um well, well, well let's do that so when metallica like what four albums that is their imperial phase oh it's it's probably uh ride the lightning through the black album yeah and but, i i would agree with that and then nothing after the black album ever really lives up to the stuff before and even kill em all whereas i love it it's because it's just punky thrashy uh -huh. youthful exuberance it doesn't stand up to the other albums yeah yeah, I would say that. It doesn't sound like Metallica yet. It sounds like a band that's going to become Metallica. Sounds like their demo tape. Yeah. Whereas Black Sabbath, self-titled the first album, Sabbath comes out the gate sounding just like Black Sabbath. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because like, uh, I, was, I was just going down the Google rabbit hole of Imperial Phases. and Okay. And Led Zeppelin, it's the first four albums. Yeah, for sure. Sabbath, people are a little iffy if it's the first four or the first six. Oh yeah. So whether or no, no one thinks that technical ecstasy and never say die make it into the imperial phase, but people make a case for sabotage why and it Sabbath, gotta, bloody Sabbath. Why is it got to be four albums? I mean, do you really? It think, doesn't have oh, okay. to be four. It could be six. But I mean, could it be two? I mean, could it? Be? You know, I think. I mean, like say, like the Jimi Hendrix experience just only did three albums. Yeah. So Hendrix only had an imperial phase, and then he died. Well, yeah, I think if it, an artist dies young, then that's that's probably gonna. I mean, the whole concept of imperial phase is mm -hmm. moot because there is no lesser output afterwards. Yeah. Do you ever feel thankful about that? I. Oh, it's a weird. That's dark. It's dark, but. Um, I always think about the like the Carlos Santana albums of the oh, late nineties, and be thankful that Jimi Hendrix never had a late nineties revival uh, where he did old man rock. I always yeah. think like, yeah, it's kind of good you're not here. You know, sometimes I do like it when a band ends and doesn't try to come back. Like that's like I've um, I've watched some documentaries from Led Zeppelin, and mm -hmm. they often will talk about that. They're like, we did it. Yeah, it was it was it was there and it was excellent and it was the time of our lives, but we're done with that and we can never do it again. Yeah, they're very protective of their legacy and not sullying it. I think that's really cool. Yeah, and I wish that there were a lot more bands that would do that because they they end up putting out they end up putting out Lulu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but who's Lulu look bad on? Lou Reed or on Metallica? Lou Reed. <laughs> it really does look bad on Lou Reed. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, but then there's the other side since we're talking Sabbath, Sabbath came back and did 13 and that's a pretty good record. Yeah. But also I would say that, so that's a pretty good record, but I would say that, um, the, re the, the sullying of the legacy are those lame middle year Aussie albums. That's like mm. Aussie being just, just hot garbage. You don't like the mid period Aussie? Ugh. The glam Aussie with the. Oh, with the teased up hair where he looks like he looks like your aunt who uh <laughs> who's trying to be hip yeah but like crazy train comes out of that 
time period. That's a that's a banger. I mean, but there's a f- so there's a few songs that really come out of there mm-hmm. because Ozzy would bring in these hot shot guitarists and ring them out for their <laughs> their creativity and then switch to a new one. Mm-hmm. And so I don't really call. I mean, he's like a creative vampire during those uh, their those eras. For, yeah, like Jakey e. Lee and Randy Rhodes and all of those guys. Zach Wild, Lemmy, yeah. Lemmy wrote a lot of Ozzy's big songs. Yeah, so I mean, I I, I don't know. We're really off on a tangent. <laughs> we should roll so for initiative. Let's roll for initiative. <laughs> Sixteen. It's you. I got a two. All right, so I got a few things to talk about. Um, uh, let's start with a little bit of news. Okay. Uh, for for the nerds out there, Microsoft bought Activision Blizzard for 68 million dollars so now we're gonna have um you know world of warcraft and starcraft and diablo and all that all those properties owned by microsoft Mm -hmm. their ceo for activision blizzard is out and they're going to be run by uh microsoft game studio um and so this isn't this isn't just a we now own you and we're gonna and we're gonna make the profits uh Mm -hmm. from your labors it's we we bought you and now we're absorbing you. You now are part of Microsoft. That's probably good for Blizzard because they had some culture problems well, there. Well, within the last five years, there have been some terrible, um, terrible culture problems and terrible um, abusive scenarios. Mm-hmm. But as far as things go, that was mostly just like executive people, yeah. not the creatives. Like, right. like I mean, it, once you put an MBA in charge of a bunch of creative people, he's going to be an abusive prick because that's who's <laughs> attracted to getting getting an MBA. Yeah. Sorry divers if you have an MBA, but you're probably a prick. <laughs> yeah, I want Yeah, I, I agree with that. But see, that's why it's good that they they cut the head off the snake and put an, their own head on it. They're not better. Uh, are they? Well, no, you're right. <laughs> you're right. <It's> Actually, Microsoft. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> Everyone cheers when they cut the head off the snake, and then the new cyber snake shows up. <laughs> like, oh, shit, it has a metal neck. <laughs> we can't cut its head off. <laughs> yeah, bummer. What do you what do you think this means though? Like what what are we going to get? What's the good and bad that we'll get out of this? Well, they did say Microsoft said that they re, but, you know, they reviewed Blizzard's um, you know, basically their 10-year plan for their release mm-hmm. cycle and all that and they're really excited for it. Yeah. So I think that's going to mean that there's going to be a lot of that stuff is going to be pushed through whether it's ready or not, okay. ramrodded. Um there's going to probably be a forever perpetual milking of old properties. Yeah. Um, but that was already happening. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't think it's going to change a lot for the end user, but I just think that, I mean, it's not like Blizzard was really like a, you know, like a small time game studio. Yeah. It was, it was just, you know, it, it was its own thing. Like Blizzard properties are very cool. I always like them kind of like Bethesda, you yeah. know, I, I like all Bethesda's properties, which Microsoft also bought. Yeah. I just kind of feel like, this sucks for gaming. It does because I um, I was kind of done with Microsoft. I wasn't going to... I was I signed up for Team PlayStation and I wasn't going to go yeah. uh, with Xbox. But I do want those Bethesda games. I want new Fallout and I want new... Are those Microsoft uh, only? No PlayStation? Yeah, yeah. New Elder Scrolls? Yeah, but Elder Scrolls, they've been milking Skyrim for a decade. They're never going to put out it. I mean, they will, but when? I know. I hate that shit. I hate, I hate when uh, a game I love and I want a new one to come out and they just do online add-ons to mm-hmm. it forever and I'm, I'm just not interested. It's like, in... I've already played this and mm-hmm. I don't want to put in, you know, 50 hours in the same game to do a little more content. Yeah. All right, so let's move on. I got okay. a couple more things. Picard Season 2 trailer came out. And Today, I, I haven't watched it yet. It looks dope. The new, uh, the new series or the new uh, season is going to be out March 3rd. So if you haven't watched... Uh, season one of Picard, it's very bingeable, mm-hmm. it's very good, and it's you know, you have over a month to do it, so that's good. Um, uh, Rings of Power teaser came out, mm-hmm. um, and it's pretty. I mean, it's just that they were literally announcing the name of the show, the yeah. new Lord of the Rings show, it wasn't anything more than that, but it's cool. Because it kind of has the, you know, like it shows like the forging of these metal things and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And then it shows you the title Rings of Power and Steel or whatnot. And it, 
it, it was almost a little disappointing because it almost looked like shitty CG or whatever. <laughs> but when you watch, they, they have like on the Amazon thing, you can watch the making of the teaser. Like that's the thing people do. Yeah. But it turns out um, they actually did have those things cast in steel that's oh, wow. real footage of molten metal going through channels and stuff and i thought that was dope mm-hmm. i mean i'll watch this it's probably not going to be amazing but i'm gonna watch it yeah you know i need to temper my expectations because three uh, three movies of the hobbit kind of <laughs> killed it yeah that's like true. bird shit radagast <laughs> come on <laughs> Yeah, but we have our our fan edit of the Hobbit That's that we true. like. That was pretty good. Um, I'm into this. I honestly, I was underwhelmed by Wheel of Time, and that kind mm. of like made me a little more trepidatious than I was previously. But I, I think this is a a fertile part of the Lord of the Rings mythology to work in. Yeah, I mean, once you own the rights, there's a lot you can do, mm-hmm. you know? And it's a very... If you wanted to, to make a Tolkien Game of Thrones kind of thing, this is the time period to set it in. For at. sure. And then I have one more thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Legend of Vox Machina comes out January 28th. So when this episode drops, it will have been out for a couple of days. Nice. So um, it's the Critical Role Dungeons & Dragons cartoon. Um they have trailers out and there's a couple of them. Uh, there's like a red band trailer mm-hmm. and whatnot. And, um, it's already fully funded for a second season there. It almost kind of burns me that, um, critics already have access to the first <laughs> two episodes and they've been posting reviews and I've read some of these reviews and they're clearly people who one do not play dungeons and dragons. Okay. And two have never heard of critical role. Um. And I was like, why the fuck were you given a copy of it? Like you're not in this for either, you know, you're not in this at all. You're, you're just generic TV reviewer. Right. And so they're like, it's a cartoon based on a game that's played by people on the internet. And I'm like, Oh fuck you. And I don't even keep reading the, the review. <laughs> so anyway, the, th- the cool thing about that they just recently posted mm-hmm. about this is, um, they called it like the legend of the cast of Vox Machina or whatever. Mm-hmm. And they have some huge names involved in this on the voice cast. David Tennant, who mm. everybody knows. Rory McCann, who played the Hound in Game of Thrones. They have Billy Boyd, who played Pippin mm-hmm. in the Lord of the Rings stuff. And they just have tons of other amazing voice actors in addition to the main cast at Critical yeah. Role who are all well-known voice actors. Yeah, um, just from watching the trailers, not being nearly as familiar with it as you, I recognize all the voices. Yeah. Like from being an animation fan, and it's like these are all voices that I've yeah. heard. Yeah, if you've watched any dub anything mm-hmm. or whatnot, you know all their voices yeah. because they're they're huge. Like every, every year whenever they do, when whenever awards come out, one of the critical role people gets an award mm-hmm. for something. It's usually Laura Bailey because she's kind of a kind of a big deal but yeah yeah i'm looking forward to that it looks it looks intriguing that's that's my news that's my initiative what about you um okay i've got a few things um number one uh joss whedon came out of hiding i saw that and did an interview um that i think he thinks makes him more sympathetic but really makes him look like even more of an asshole. Yeah, it makes you hate him more. It really, you know, like, it did make me understand him, and it humanized him in a way, Mm -hmm. but it also, uh, it just, like, you know, he just accepts no culpability for anything, and even for his own success. Like, he's like, the internet, the old internet raised me up, and the new internet has torn me down. And it's like, no, 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 no. You made some shows that people really loved, and people supported you on the internet because they liked what you were doing and then they found out you were an asshole and they also broadcast that through the channels that they used to to support you with it made me think of it made me think of like this is like an interview with grima worm worm tongue (laughs) after the fact where he's explaining his side of the story and you're like okay i get it yeah you're still a shitter yeah at no point does it seem like he didn't behave in a shitty way. And then he denies it and kind of gaslights the people that called him out. Like, uh, he makes it out to be like, uh, charisma carpenter is being puppeted by Ray Fisher and Ray Fisher is being puppeted by Zack Snyder. And it's like, 
come on, dude. Zack Snyder doesn't give a shit about you. Yeah, it, he, it's, he he could buy and sell you, dude. Mm-hmm, and, it's, and it's one of those things, and this, this always pisses me off when somebody um, tries to take away the power of somebody else by mm-hmm. saying, oh, blah, 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 you're being put up to this. Your words aren't even your own or whatever. It's like, so you're basically saying that that person's not even a person and they don't even have their own opinions. They're, they're not even strong enough to voice their own mind. Mm-hmm. Like, you're taking away their their power completely as a person you're mm-hmm. you're trying to deplatform and and uh distract and if you're trying to make the case that you're not sexist and you're not racist doing that um you know or like when he said gal gadot he's like english isn't her second language and i think she didn't understand the the flowery language i use and it's like uh, i bet she speaks three more languages than you it's it's just Ugh. yeah he just came out looking like a piece of shit um fuck josh whedon and i will never i will never like one of his properties and i just want to say this out there to all of you buffy fans and all (laughs) you brown coats i was right the whole time when you (laughs) kept telling me it was amazing it never was and the guy that made it is a hack i go on record as saying he's a hack for forever (laughs) i've always said he's a hack i finally vindicated Mm. i've been gaslighted by all these brown coat (laughs) nerds (laughs) you know i will say this uh and it's the same thing i'll say about harry potter when these things have meant something to the fan community they belong to you now and and you can uh if if somehow you found meaning in buffy the vampire slayer or or the the brown coat community whatever it is um don't let Joss Whedon ruin that for you just because he's a dick. A lot of people made those shows and movies, and most of them are probably pretty decent people that you can still support. Yeah, and if you're a diver who doesn't know me personally, because I know a lot of a lot mm-hmm. of the divers do know me, um, <laughs> I say all this tongue in cheek. Like, yeah, I I liked uh, Ser- you know Serenity and all this stuff. Firefly. I like I, uh, the movies, the show, everything. I like the actors. I think they're great. Mm-hmm. I think I think that. If you're going to shit can a whole creative endeavor that was a, made by a gigantic team because one person is terrible, mm-hmm. um, that's a disservice to all the other people. I just like to tell people I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> right. And this has been true since the very first episode. We never miss an opportunity to take a shit on Josh Whedon. Yes. <laughs> Forever, forever, <laughs> never gonna stop. Okay, so just keep it, keep it popping. Uh, the Moon Knight trailer dropped. I didn't see it. You haven't watched that. No. Okay, so this is starring Oscar Isaac and Ethan Hawke, um, Mohammed Daib, and the team of uh, Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead are directing it, and uh, Jeremy Slater is the head writer. It drops on Disney Plus on March thirtieth. Oh. And there's a few things that make me interested in this beyond the fact that I'm in the bag because uh, I'll just watch whatever Marvel bullshit drops. So I'm the exact opposite. I've yeah. turned the switch off for mm-hmm. Marvel, so something has to be amazing to get me to turn it on. So here's what makes me interested in it. One, Oscar Isaac and Ethan Hawke. Yeah, they're good. So Oscar Isaac, I had the impression from the stuff that he had said after uh, The Rise of Skywalker that he was done with the mouse. Hmm. So I don't think the mouse could get him back if it wasn't an interesting project. And Ethan Hawke is in the same boat as you, actually probably even more anti-Marvel than you, because he even said that Logan wasn't that good. Whoa! He said, Logan isn't a great movie. It's good for a superhero movie. And sad but true. Yeah. And so Ethan Hawke, I think to get Oscar Isaac and Ethan Hawke, there has to be something interesting going on. Yeah, Oscar I wasn't aware of Ethan Hawke, uh, but I knew Oscar Isaac was pretty much done with Disney. Yeah. And um the trailer just looks really cool. If you're not familiar with the character, he's uh a, a guy with multiple multiple personalities, or I guess disassociative personality disorder, um, that gets made he gets made into a uh, sort of a an avenging character by uh, egyptian moon god called Khonshu, hmm. and he has all these different like sort of like uh an archaeologist persona and a sort of a batman-esque persona and a super spy persona and he uh shifts between all of them 
and you can see even in the trailer uh oscar isaac is do it almost like a like that show orphan black where she plays multiple characters Mm -hmm. he's do he's really like doing a bunch of different bunch of different characters and it just looks interesting i think this will be an interesting show do you think they're able to escape the uh just the idea that they've made mental illness into a plot trope and they are appropriating a different culture that it well i think um just judging by the name i think there's a a reason why uh mohammed daib is the, the lead director on it okay i think they're gonna try and do do right by egyptian culture and not make it a appropriation thing gotcha and um and i just does the people who are involved make me less skeptical of this than I might be? Okay. So I think that looks really good. And then my final thing was uh, R.I.P. Meatloaf. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. The singer Meatloaf, uh, two just like classic albums, one from the 70s and one from the 90s. He's been in a bunch of movies that are diver related, such as uh, Fight Club, which I think will probably be our yeah, next episode. We're, we're, yeah, we're definitely... That's a... That's a twofer because we're gonna get some, uh, you know, get some meatloaf and, and some and some more Brad Pitt, some Brad Pitt, mm-hmm. you know. and uh, you know, and Rocky Horror and it's Spice World, Wayne's World. <laughs> he he's done a lot of. I forgot about Spice World. Yeah, he's he's the bus driver in Spice yeah. World. Yeah, it's like he's just done, done a lot of cool shit, and he had a great voice. Yeah, he did. Um, and that shit all like, you know. It, I love to put on uh, a meatloaf song because they're all long. So I like to put them on the jukebox at a bar and, and just kind of watch the room. Watch the crowd, r- yeah. yeah, watch the room ride the song because at first everyone has the same reaction. Like they're like, oh, meatloaf. But then it's like people are singing along with it. By the end, it's just like when, a, when you have an 11 minute song, people get taken on the journey whether they want to or not. Yeah, I haven't been to a bar with a jukebox in a while. I know this was this is sort of a throwback. It has been a minute. Yeah, that that needs to come back. Mm-hmm. I love ju- I you know I like old school jukeboxes where they have records or CDs in them. Not the ones that are just little boxes connected to a streaming device. That irritates me, and the way they charge you more for more song, like for certain songs, like. If it's a longer song, you mm-hmm. pay more or whatnot. Yeah, I don't like the digital jukeboxes. I like yeah, it to I actually have media Yeah, I think one with a CD is CD jukeboxes is the way to go because you can get a lot more into it. Yeah. All right. That's all I got. All right. Let's go ahead and take a break. Come back and deep dive this up. Okay, welcome back, divers. We got so caught up in our role for initiative that we forgot to give you the podcast fuel. And yeah, let's so, do that now. Yeah, so we are drinking Pink Sabbath uh, from Great Notion. It's a collab with Steeplejack and Pink Boot Society. It's a Cascadian Dark Ale or a Black IPA. It is 6.66 ABV, no IBUs listed. And uh, they probably can, no bitterness. This is this isn't. It's kind of bit. It it has IBUs. You think? You yeah, think? it it should have IBUs. Just no one's really doing that anymore. Yeah, they're not it, because it used to be a race. Yeah, how many IBUs can you put into it? Yeah, this is their foray into the dark side of hops. The Black IPA is an unholy union of rye malts, Chinook, Cascade, and Citra hops. Uh, I like this. I like every brewery that's involved with it, and. Uh, we're both on record with of liking this beer style, and yeah. I always love it when I can find something that themes really perfectly to the to the episode, and this one did. Yeah, this is a really really good beer. It's a good example of the CDA style. I dig it. Um, so yeah, this is this is a good one. Great notion coming through again. I think we've had them uh, oh, yeah. before, not too long ago. So let's go ahead and jump into this. Um, so divers, we we. Uh, we watched the classic albums uh, documentary on Amazon mm-hmm. about this album, and it's basically set up where they talk to the band, each individual member, and they talk to several critics, and they also talk to you know s- some other random people, like Henry Rollins is in there and whatnot. Yeah. And there's a lot of insight um, going on throughout, but they do it all 
janky and out of order. We decided we're going to follow the actual album of Paranoid, not mm-hmm. that documentary, and just treat that kind of as a background knowledge. This isn't a deep dive of the uh, cl- of classic, the classic album episode. episode. Yeah. This is a deep dive of an album. Mm-hmm. Um, so just to sort of set the stage, is this is a band that had been playing... Um, playing together for a little while and they were called earth Mm -hmm. and they were, um, they were just some, you know, low, low class, uh, scruffy dudes Mm -hmm. making, making some heavy rock and roll. Yeah. And, uh, they, they eventually got together with a manager and they knew they had to change their name, changed it to black Sabbath. Yeah, which black Sabbath, that name, it comes from a old spaghetti horror movie with Boris Karloff in it. Um, Mm -hmm. and you know, it's sort of like that, they talk about that being sort of the magic combination where they, they come up with that name and then with the sort of doomy. Then they have a theme they can riff on. Yeah. The, and everyone is sort of into it. Yeah. You know, they, they're coming out of Birmingham, uh, England. It's in the in the Midlands of England. And it's an industrial town, like what we call the Rust Belt in America. Very Pittsburgh, Detroit kind of vibe. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, that's... A place where you have these industrial smokestacks and just the sound of industry and everything. And that really just infects their music. And uh, Judas Priest also comes from there. So yeah, Birmingham really gave us heavy metal, you know. Yeah, this um, sort of on the origins of heavy metal uh, as we know it. There's, you know, there's a lot to be said about who the first bands were and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And... You know, there's a lot of people that that try to say things, uh, you know, that there were people, bands doing things before Black Sabbath ever came out. Sure. But one thing I would I would say to that is that Black Sabbath changed the game. Mm -hmm. They they made this stripped uh, music that was more about feel and more about vibe. It wasn't so much about like musical uh technical theatrics and whatnot mm-hmm. it was it was way less um i don't know it was way less proggy it was it was kind of stripped to the blues roots and, yeah and it was just just darkness and just heaviness and this is to me this is sort of where bands uh the the real heaviness comes from yeah Where, it, whereas there are faster bands but this nobody is heavier than them as far as i know the first use of the word heavy metal was uh to describe Jimi hendrix and hendrix is very far away from what you think of as being metal yeah a lot of people will say that led zeppelin is the first heavy metal yeah um um but you know, they don't sound anything like metal does now. Sabbath yeah. does. Sabbath does. And that's the, like this is like the first true metal band. Yeah, they didn't just sort of uh spawn metal. They were metal. Yeah. Whether they knew it or not. Yeah, they mean they didn't call themselves heavy metal at the time. But if you listen to this album mm-hmm. and you listen to any modern uh metal album, you're like, yeah, I can see where this came from that. Yeah, for and, sure. And so I think that that's, for me, even though it's probably not technically true, mm-hmm. uh, Sabbath is the originators of metal as yeah. we know it. I think it is technically true. I, okay. I, I think, uh, People will argue with me about that. I know, because yeah. I argued with somebody about this recently. And and what did they say was... Stuff like Deep Purple predates them, and, and there were other, other things, you know, you know. I don't think so, like... I, I don't pur- think Deep Purple sounds like heavy metal to me deep purple is not metal yeah that's the thing if you listen to deep purple you don't think oh there's metal that's you think oh classic rock you listen to paranoid that's fucking metal yeah it (laughs) it really is i mean it's the difference between you know i don't know for say for for punk rock um they'll talk about uh, the Velvet Underground as Mm -hmm. being kind of an early form of punk it doesn't sound anything like punk rock The Ramones are like the first punk band, you yeah. know, or the, even the New York Dolls is getting close, mm-hmm. but it's still a glam band. Like, there's a point. Even Joey Ramone takes influence from this album, actually. Yeah. He really there, loved it. There's a lot of uh, punk influence that you can kind of get out of this or, or opposite. There's a lot of influence on punk from this, mm-hmm. especially when they do some of their bluesy, almost like uh boogie uh-huh. riffs and paranoid's you know? a punk song like yeah. and if you look at the um the wikipedia entry you know how wikipedia always like categorizes everything yeah. and it says uh heavy metal proto-punk 
For sure. And it's like... Um, it's kind of like Venom. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Venom's a lot. Influence <laughs> punk a lot. Yeah. Um, it was something... Because I just recently... We uh, should do one of these on black metal. Oh, the on album. the Venom album? Yeah. Ooh, that would be fun. That'd be really fun. I wonder if the divers are into that. Um, they don't we'll have a choice. They. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, they do. They yeah. just not We're not like Black Sabbath. You can't tell us to change the album title <laughs> or whatever. We'll just do what we want. And if you don't listen, it's like, oh, well, we had fun. Yeah, yeah. We weren't making money anyway. <laughs> um, but I was going to say, uh, I just recently listened to Steve Jones's memoir from The Sex Pistols. Mm-hmm. And he specifically lists Black Sabbath as one of those. That was like a revelatory band. When he first heard them, he's like, what the fuck is this? Nothing sounds like this. Yeah, like, you remember back when we were youngsters, and there Mm -hmm. were some radio stations in Portland, there was a classic rock station. KGON. And then there was, like, a a rock station, like 101. Yeah, RIP KUFO, which is now, like, conservative talk radio. Yeah, lame. Um, But, like... Sabbath was a band that would be played on either of those stations, mm-hmm. and any time they came on, I would not change it. Yeah, it was it's, just like yes, <laughs> it's a Sabbath. it's a turn up. Yeah, so I mean, let's I'll just continue this thread of talking about how much we love this. If you had asked me two weeks ago, what's the defining album of your teen years? Oh. I would say Nirvana, Nevermind, just off okay. the, offhandedly, because I remember that as being like a real pivotal moment, like everything changed. Mm-hmm. There's no way I've listened to that album as much as I've listened to this album. Yeah, I don't think that it has to have come out when you were a teen. Yeah. It's just what you got into mm-hmm. as a teen. So this really is the definitive album of my teen years. This was the one that my friends banded around for whatever mm-hmm. reason like this is the thing that defined us interesting yeah that's yeah this was this was not that album for me i actually got strangely i got into black sabbath a little after mm-hmm. i got into thrash metal yeah uh because i was interested in like what did these guys like yeah and then i started listening to stuff from from before the 80s thrash metal which was yeah. my stuff i i would imagine you came here through typo negative that's seems like the route that would take you to black sabbath yeah i mean i definitely there was probably a couple of routes i'd say my my seminal album was probably ride the lightning yeah and um you know it was also it was written when i it was published when i was four so obviously (laughs) i i came out uh you know i I came to it later in life because i have two brothers that are Mm. much older than me so i came into uh, music from them but yeah like when i was reading interviews with like james hetfield or kirk hammock because back in the day we would just you go to magazine you would read yeah. magazines all the time right you go to you go to go 7-11 to or, or whatever or whatever get yeah circus metal edge i would get Kerrang when the import magazine started coming for me guitar world yeah. always and so i'd read and they would you know they would often drop Tony Iommi's name. Mm-hmm. And so I would have to check that out. And yeah. But then when Black Sabbath, or when, when Typo Negative did a cover of a Sabbath song, mm-hmm. I was like, okay, this is fucking great. Yeah. And so I was really then kind of hooked on it. But I think this album, this album is probably, I would say, the best Black Sabbath album, uh, which is important. Why mm-hmm. we're doing this album, I think. Mm-hmm. It's probably their signature album. It has I think their so, biggest too. hits. And I wanted to talk briefly about how they wrote it before we get into the track by track. Okay. So I so there's it's kind of the apocryphal story that they went into the they went into the studio and they recorded it in two days and that was and then that was it because they had to get off to a gig in Germany. Mm-hmm. Um, and that did happen. Yeah. Um, and they had the engineer there in this in this uh, documentary thing mm-hmm. talking about it. But one thing that I think is really important to um, kind of consider obviously this wasn't their first album no they were a they were a seasoned band that had been playing this uh music this playing together uh constantly yeah and they were playing these uh shows at the star club that were you know they were famous for having the beatles but they had to play these 45 minute sets and they would play the same song And make it a 45-minute song and jam and riff and change things and just flow together. And it it seemed kind of like Iomi was the musical leader. He would would plot the course and everybody else would just morph around him and Mm -hmm. kind of like a school of fish. Yeah. Um, 
And it's it's just they workshopped these songs um, beyond what any band I've ever been in has ever done with a song. Yeah, that's sort of doing eight 45 minute sets um, in a day. Mm-hmm. It's where you start in the afternoon and you're just playing to an empty room. Yeah, they they said they'd start at like 2 p.m. and play all night. Brutal. Play 45 minutes, take 15 off. And a lot of British bands, like as they alluded to, uh, started out this way. That's how the Beatles got so fucking tight, too. Yeah, just it's, play all the time mm-hmm. and just become completely in tune with one another. Yeah. And I really like that. It's... um. When you're playing music with someone else that you really have an, a chemistry with mm-hmm. and you can see how they're like moving and shifting things and you can react and you can kind of have this synergy, um, it's it's a really great feeling. It's like this crazy in the moment thing. Yeah. And it's weird to see. And, and oftentimes in a band, it's usually two members that have that, like mm-hmm. a drummer and a guitar player or a guitar player and a bass player or whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um this band, it's all four of them. And yeah. so that makes it that makes it magical. That makes yeah. it special. The Beatles were the same way. It mm-hmm. was all four of them. It wasn't it wasn't just a couple of amazing musicians who were doing things together. It was uh it was just a whole group, four dudes that were all totally in tune. And mm-hmm. that's what kind of that was the special sauce that let them go in there for two days and make this album that uh, Iomi said, I think it was Iomi, no, or maybe it was Bill Ward said there's, there's not much multi-tracking. There was a couple of extra guitar overdubs, mm-hmm. but everything else was basically a one, one play through, um, l- capture it live. Mm-hmm. The, uh, the guy who was producing it had seen them live mm-hmm. and wanted to, wanted to make sure that he captured that vibe. Yeah. So you can hear when you get, when you hear isolations of just the drum tracks, you can hear the bass mm-hmm. in those parts because <laughs> they were in the same room. Yeah. Um, and so this was, this was really this, this, uh, I guess this album has mojo. Yeah, for right? sure. I mean, and I don't if- know how else to describe it. And so going into this, I had it in my head that we talked uh, with Zeppelin about the three, three-legged three stool. Mm-hmm. The Zeppelin, it's British hard rock, uh, American blues, and English folk music. Okay. And I thought that Sabbath had the same three legs, but the the third leg of the Sabbath stool is jazz. Okay. And it's very jazz. Tony Iommi's guitar playing is very jazz influenced. Mm-hmm. Which... The drumming is super jazzy. Oh yeah, totally. And so Bill Bill Ward is um I don't think he's given his due as as an amazing phenomenal drummer. And that's what bummed me out uh about the the last the final Sabbath reunion tour mm-hmm. was Bill Ward was not involved in it yeah they just didn't think he could do it because he'd had a heart attack and they kind of just kind of cut him out like that he's not up to this and he wanted to do it and the whole thing left a bad taste in my mouth yeah i I, agree i I saw them in 2004 and it was beautiful like it was (laughs) like they were just like it was like you know they hadn't missed a beat at all so i just kind of hated that they went out without without bill ward because he's such an important part yeah. of their sound i mean i i agree so basically i just wanted to talk a little bit about that mm-hmm. how how this this album it, it was recorded in two days it was but it was not rushed yeah this was this was like um you know they could play these songs uh off the cuff as easy as you know you do the the opening key sequence to unlock your cell phone Mm -hmm. you know it's just something that is it's like muscle memory it was road tested stage tested and heavily workshopped before they went in there for Mm -hmm. their two two 12 hour sessions 10 to 10 yeah i mean and and it sounds fucking fucking awesome Mm -hmm. so maybe we should just sort of get into these tracks a little bit sure do you want to what do we do we want to play play a little bit of war pigs yeah maybe play that opening because it's pretty iconic it's how the how the album starts off and it kind of starts off with a with a punch yeah okay i'm good with the opening Yeah, 
man, I hate to cut you off right there before Ozzy comes in, but uh, just we're just giving you a little taste, just a fair use taste. Yeah, we want to stay within that 30-second fair use for the purpose of criticism. I mean, we're going to get bumped off YouTube yeah, yeah. anyway. But you, YouTube's going to gonna get us, but hopefully the divers who listen to us elsewhere, uh, you know, that's fine. I mean, we'll. I think it'll still be on YouTube. It's yeah. just demonetized and anything goes to them not yeah. like that matters they mm-hmm. can have one cent <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah this i love how this starts off with like a slow kind of plotting intro and then it almost it's like the that part that yeah that really that's where it feels like the song begins it's yeah. like the first part sets the mood with those air raid sirens yeah and i was just thinking the air raid siren um uh, how evocative even in 1969 that's still very evocative in england where Mm -hmm. they you know um they're not old enough the members of sabbath aren't old enough to have uh, really probably remember world war ii if only vaguely but you know their parents yeah went, went through that through the blitz and went through air raids and german bombings and all that stuff and it left uh a psychic impression on england yeah, this song was one of those ones where it was this. So this was supposed to be called something else, Walpurgis. Yeah, which is like the Night of Witches or whatnot. Mm-hmm. This was this was part of the Black Sabbath theme. Like, yeah, this was one of those early songs where Geezer was like, "All right, I'm leaning into this satanic stuff and evil and witchcraft and all of this." But it's interesting because it's never pro pro satan no right and the and the underlying theme of it is this idea that the real satanists are the warmongers yeah basically like the big the big money war hawks Mm -hmm. those guys are the ultimate evil yeah and that's pretty cool and so that's what the valpurgis uh, you know it's generals gathered in their masses just like witches at black masses it's you know uh an English teacher would tell you not to rhyme masses with masses, but it's it's <laughs> still it works. It still works. It's a song, you mm-hmm. know. It's okay. Yeah, Repetition and petition flows. I think listening to this at, at sixteen years old, like this is fairly revelatory because it's calling the the powers that be into question and mm-hmm. stuff. You know, we're jaded and we just assume that uh, you know politicians and and big money interests are warmongers, but. You know, when you're a kid, you kind of think you might have other ideas about how the world works. And Sabbath takes the blinders off. Yeah, for sure. And and it was it's funny how basically Geezer was like, yeah, I wanted to call it uh, Valpurgis, but they thought that that, you know, that was sounded too evil. So I was like, how about War Pigs? Basically, like, I'm just going to call it exactly what it is mm-hmm. rather than being cheeky and clever yeah. and masking it. I'm just going to be blatant. And they're like, oh, okay, that works. Yeah, <laughs> it is. And Valpurgis is a, a Christian holiday. So I yeah, don't, it is. It's funny. It's it's a, it's a one of those Christian holidays that overlays a pagan holiday. Yeah, it's one of those uh, cult- cultural appropriation yeah, holidays. Yeah, but the actual... It's that's Saint Valpurgis, you know, or that it, that it's celebrating, and it just seems weird that it was uh, a controversial title at all. It seems like they could have uh, kind of lawyered their way out of that, explaining what it means, mm-hmm. but they just gave up gave up the fight. And they wanted to call the album War Pigs, but that was too. Uh, they didn't want the U.S. label. Yeah, didn't want anything that might be. Uh, considered criticism of the Vietnam War. Yeah, that, that's yeah. It's because England's not involved in the in the Vietnam War, but back at, at Warner Brothers HQ, they're like, no, that's no good for us. <laughs> yeah. War pigs, and they're like, we already shot a picture of a guy in a, a helmet and shield with a sword. <laughs> we already got this. Is the theme is war, and they're like, mm, something nah, else. Change it, which is weird because these guys are English, uh-huh. and it doesn't really talk about Vietnam. I mean, well, it, it, does. it talks about war in general. It does. Uh, uh, no, it, um, not Electric Fury. Hand of Doom calls out Vietnam specifically. Yeah, Hand of Doom, uh, Hand of Doom is one of those songs I can't wait to get to. But, okay. um, yeah, I, I really like this song. I think it was a great way to open the album. I think, uh, it's a, it's a strong, uh, entry. I love a, a almost eight minute long song as mm-hmm. your opener. It's a big middle finger to the establishment, yeah. music establishment. Like I don't hear a single. No, you don't. 
<laughs> yeah, that's that's not what we do here. Yeah, and so it and it right from the start it introduces. There's two prevailing themes for the whole album, and it's mm-hmm. the horrors of war and mental health slash addiction. Yes, and those come up again and again throughout the whole album, and it just right from the start. That's what they're not sugarcoating anything. They're just giving it to you. Yeah, I think this is one of those songs where, um, I mean, this one got played to death on the radio. Mm-hmm. Eventually, um, but it wasn't a single. No, I mean, eventually. And, and I think sometimes they even cut out the opening intro and they would just start it right there. From the, the dinner. Dinner. And uh, it, it's one of those songs that when you hear it, you're just like, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember this Black Sabbath. It's mm-hmm. just, it's so classic. Um, it's a pretty good one. I, it's, I mean, we're going to do what our favorite songs are at the very end. Okay. Um, I think that this one mostly was setting the tone. Yeah. Um, and, and Ozzy's vocals really kind of come out of the gate charging early on. And something I love about Ozzy's vocals in this, uh, is that he, he doesn't always hold his notes. Mm -hmm. You can hear his voice waver and that just it actually it lends to the raw urgency of the of the recording um because now you would go through and pro tools that and and you just do another take yeah and you or and you double yourself mm-hmm. and you know yeah drink a drink a glass of lemon tea or, or whatever <laughs> with honey and like try and get your vocal cords more limbered up but they just they went with the the raw take and i i always appreciate the i always prefer the raw take to the clean up yeah one. that's one of the charms of listening to a live album sometimes mm-hmm. is you hear that you hear the realness of it and and that's always one of those things where you hear like, does this vocal, how strong is this guy's vocal? Is it super, super processed or is this the mm-hmm. real deal? And so this was the real deal. Yeah. And something the classic albums episode did was this was one where they, they played us some of the isolated tracks and they played Iomi's guitar mm-hmm. and then they, they dropped the guitar and just played Geezer's bass. Oh, and yeah. I just am in love with that guy's that he plays with his fingers it's not a pick it's yeah. it's jazzier and he's all over the place just boom 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 yeah i mean you hear his playing all over cliff burton's playing oh yeah yeah because he, he's a fingers yeah, guy too it's yeah. just so good like mm-hmm. i i really really like the bass playing in this entire album yeah and when they isolate it um you really hear how good he is and you hear how um how how active his bass lines are that's Mm -hmm. something that tony iomi said it's like you don't find bass players like him yeah people that play all up and down the neck they're very active you hear people who just pluck on the root note Mm -hmm. there was in uh some other sabbath documentary i watched last night iomi talked about and this is probably in the 90s, he's saying this about how now that he's played with other drummers and bass players, Mm -hmm. he didn't realize how special uh, Bill and Geezer were until Mm -hmm. he played with other people and was like, oh, it's not normal that you can just improvise behind me crazy jazz riffs. Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I play something weird and you play something awesome. Like it's, uh, yeah. Not everyone can do that. (laughs) <laughs> yeah he just it's like but they just lucked into finding each other as kids basically yeah and i think they part of that is that they kind of i guess musically they grew up together yeah so they kind of evolved their abilities uh at the same time all right so let's go ahead and check out uh the second song paranoid which is a title track which was written last mm-hmm. and it was a time filler because they the the record label needed another short track in order to fill up enough space to make the album the proper length yeah they're like uh give us one more like a four minute song that we can use as a single and they're like we don't do four minute songs like uh, we need one yeah go ahead and this one turned out to be like three minutes long so. yeah <laughs> perfect <laughs> so yeah this is, uh, uh, strangely enough, this was the first song, Black Sabbath song I ever learned how to play. Oh. Um, I remember um, I heard it on a tribute to Black Sabbath. The Nativity uh, in Black? Uh, yeah, Megadeth did this one. Yes. And Dave Mustaine has a particular way he attacks his rhythm parts. And I was like, oh, man, that's so abrasive, the mm-hmm. way he plays it. And so I went back and I listened to the original, which is, quite a bit smoother in yeah. the way it's played and i was like i could learn that yeah <laughs> and so i i i bought a um 
a, a tab book for for this album actually mm. and i started learning this song and so this was my this was early dave i had just transitioned from being a bass player to uh-huh. wanting to be a guitar player and paranoid's a pretty easy song it's kind of a punky song it's very punk rock yeah and so for a person who wasn't very good at guitar learning to play iomi's rhythm lines was mm. uh I wouldn't say it was super challenging, but it definitely was prepping me to be a metal guitar player, to play mm-hmm. fast and to do things with my other fingers while holding the root note with my with my index finger. So it's very interesting how this kind of started out. It's that perfect level of difficulty that where you're str- you're you're reaching just a little bit but it is within reach. Yeah, that that's called the zone of proximal development. Mm, and okay. that's exactly where I was at. Perfect. All right, let's, let's listen to a little paranoid. Yeah. That's a hell of a lead single. Like something that came up I thought a few times listening to this like putting my head in the mind space of someone in 1970 Mm -hmm. and it's like the sixties are over, you know, this is a new sound and flower power is dead and it's a much darker, more harsh kick in the teeth sort of vibe than what people would have been used to. Oh yeah, for sure. This was definitely, um, it was no longer, no longer about peace and love and happiness. This was Mm -hmm. about the, the darkness and sadness that dwells within. Yeah. This is, this is, um, uh, you know, kind of navel gazing themes, but the, the actual riff is really, um, is really driving and it's kind of, it's got an urgency to it. Yeah. Kind of a, um, almost, almost like a, um. I don't know. It's not like an angry vibe, but it, it's definitely, it gets you moving. Yeah. And it is, I mean, it's like circle pit music, right? Like there, there's shades of motorhead yet to come. And like you, mm-hmm. you said, uh, while we were listening to it, the Ramones, oh, uh, yeah. obviously Steve Jones cites it. So the sex pistols and it's like, uh, this made a big impact on people. And it's, you know, like we just talked about a little ago, like, it's achievable, right? Like you hear this as a as a young guitar player, you're like, I could kind of do that. Yeah, because you just hear him kind of like chug chugging along, like dun, 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 dun. you're like, oh yeah, that sounds yeah. good. I it, like how that goes. It's so teenage, like it's so tapped into, especially the teen boy hippocampus or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> like it's just plugged right into that attitude that you feel at that age. And so it's just so awesome. Yeah, I, I think I was I was struck by this song when I first heard it about how um, even though it's called Paranoid, mm-hmm. um, I've always been literally the worst with song titles. I forget yeah. everything, but I'll remember the lyrical hook. Mm-hmm. This song isn't about paranoia. It's about depression. Yeah. Um, and, you know, every teenager has their has their mm-hmm. uh, depressive moments. It's just part of it. And so, yeah, this song, it, it was definitely a resonating vibe. And it was crazy to me that it, you know, it had been, you know, almost 30 years since this was released and it was still so relevant. Mm-hmm. Every, every one of these lyrics and that, that's something that Rollins said. He's like, this album is timeless when you, when you put it on and you listen to it and you hear those lyrics, you think, what year was this? Oh mm-hmm. yeah, it's relevant now. Yeah. And it's so geezer, you know, he, he talks about that in the classic albums episode that he, he struggled with depression. Mm -hmm. And I, and I read a little interview with him where he said that he didn't, he didn't really understand the difference between depression and paranoia. Like it was just, you know, in that nebulous umbrella of mental health or, you know, whatever they would, whatever they would have in 1968 or 69. I think they just call it like troubled (laughs) like at at this time in history there was a lot of um there was a lot of like hiding of this sort of thing mm -hmm. they didn't talk about it it was shameful whereas in the modern day you know it's it's pretty normal to understand that you know people people need to seek mental health care and that sort of thing Mm -hmm. how it's it's an important part of your overall well-being is your mental health and so this was this was something geezer had no idea of so the name paranoia 
or paranoid was you know just what he called it and mm-hmm. you know it makes a cool album name i yeah. mean i don't know if you would have if this would have been uh better called like depression <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't think depression sounds as good as a title for a song <laughs> or an <laughs> album or an yeah. album for sure and i think it's interesting i see the you know on discogs you see this single and it was backed with the wizard which was a, mm-hmm. a track off of the first album because this came out before the album did yeah like this is the sort of like call to arms before before you even get this album paranoid yeah and so people are hearing this and they're like oh my god sabbath is playing fast yeah they're 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 really going for the throat Mm -hmm. and like this is this is the fastest song oh yeah for sure (laughs) and you know and you you talked about his lyrics a little bit it's a little on the nose i guess but the the say a joke and i will sigh and you will laugh and i will cry i mean that could be a a smith's lyric oh yeah because it's very much just about that teenage like not relating to your peers it's like it's that you know i don't even find that shit funny it's like how can you laugh when vietnam is happening man (laughs) (laughs) exactly and and that's one of the things about i I guess it's a criticism of some of the lyrics here are are that um they're very on the nose there's not a lot of poetry going on here Mm -hmm. sometimes compare especially if you compare them to like led zeppelin or whatnot it's not this isn't literature this is this is really observational kind of blue collar stuff yeah it's very working class and it's very punk rock like especially this track um yeah i think it's it's funny how sometimes a band will have one song or sometimes one album that will kind of spawn successors paranoid is like a a, a successor for that driving mm-hmm. punky motorhead venom style mm-hmm. of of playing guitar and it's it's like how misfits had one hardcore album mm-hmm. and then it spawned a whole bunch of sh- hardcore bands yeah that's so there true. are entire bands that base their vibe off this song sometimes i thought of every single track on this album um there's a band named after the song title oh is there yeah interesting all of them um the the biggest stretch is fairies wear boots which that's actually a black sabbath tribute band that's called that nice but every other song a band even took jack the name. stripper well <laughs> jack the stripper is an instrumental part on fairies <laughs> wear boots <laughs> Jack the Stripper is a kind of cool band. Kind of a cool name, yeah. <laughs> be a good, like a, a be a I, good punk band name. Or I was thinking like a like an English rapper. You know, Jack mm. the Stripper really seems like I, I could see that. Yeah, I, I think the coolest name for a band out of all of these might be uh, Electric Funeral yeah. or Hand of Doom. Hand of, yeah, Hand of Doom's are. a little on the nose if you're a Doom band. <laughs> <laughs> they must be. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, for yeah. sure. So, so this song has a this song has a really killer solo, and it's really short. Yeah, and um, I wanted to ask like you about that, that solo because um, it's all analog tricks, and it's got sure. a really cool distortion on it. And I wanted to ask you how you think they achieved that sound. Sure, let's go ahead and take a look, listen to it, and then we will because it's a less than thirty second solo. Yeah, and in a three minute song, yeah. so we can then uh, analyze that after the fact. So that is a really cool solo. I really like how he uh, he kind of wanders around the fretboard quite a bit there. Mm-hmm. But um, there's a number of amazing modern tricks you could do to get that sort of vibe. Yeah. But in this time, in the late 60s or 1970, this was this sort of thing was accomplished through a few different things, few uh-huh. different methods. Um, and obviously, I don't know how they did it. I haven't researched this, I've, but I've got a theory. So I want to see what, what if, if your theory is, or your theory is the same as my. Theory. So there were effects pedals, there yeah. were effects units that you could just straight up run a guitar through, a little phaser, mm-hmm. a little modulator, a little bit of uh, that sort of thing. But there were also these guitars that, um, uh, 
for there's a thing called a Les Paul recording model. Okay. And they actually have multiple outputs, two outputs. Huh. So you can actually run through uh, th- run them through multiple amps at the same time and record them simultaneously with the same playing. Interesting. Um, and that may or may not have been done here, but also um, they they can do that manually anyway by recording the guitar track dry, uh, meaning like no effects, no distortion, nothing, mm-hmm. it, straight into a board. And this is done a lot modern, but with more, you know, it's easier now. But um, you record it dry, and then you play back that tape through, you know, a, a, a cable in direct into an amp. Mm-hmm. And then um, you record what comes out of the amp. It's called reamping. Mm. Um, and so there are, there's just like reamping boxes now that you can do this oh. with. So they actually could have re- used the exact same playing and reamped it more than one time with different amps or different um, tones. Okay. And then play them simultaneously. And because it's the same playing, it's literally the same playing. Yeah. Um, it just sounds multi-layered and it sounds huh. a little off phase. And so you could do that with different guitars. Like sometimes we'll do that. Um, or I guess you couldn't do it with different guitars. You do it with diff- different a- amps and whatnot. So I'm going to assume this was probably not multiple layers of guitar playing, but it was actually um, some sort of effect added to uh, his single guitar. Interesting. So I my theory was more old school than that mm. uh ike turner link ray those guys would play through broken amps that are blown mm-hmm. um or have holes in them or whatever and that was the sound that i thought i was detecting like well ike, it's like a blown speaker yeah ike turner is the is the inventor of distortion because mm-hmm. he was carrying his um his orange amplifier combo amp Mm -hmm. to the studio uh, from the parking lot and he dropped it yeah and the the broken amp made the distorted guitar sound and he just liked it he's like keep that and so yeah definitely um distortion is based off a broken amp Mm -hmm. it's overdriven it's out of phase the tubes are fucked up and so i could definitely see that um but I mean, at this point, by 1970, you'd already had, you know, lots of people experimenting with high gain overdriven amps and stuff, mm. obviously. And so it's probably it, it's probably like a, a big muff pedal overdriven with like some sort of phaser on it or some yeah. something. It's probably actually simpler than we're thinking. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's only like, I think, um, three guitar tracks there there's like the lead Mm -hmm. a rhythm line that he overdubbed in and then whatever that distorted version is and i don't even think that distorted version is different from the lead i think it's the The same same one the same track yeah that actually is kind of plausible or probably the most plausible occam's razor right like it's it's the simplest explanation and therefore the most likely yeah the les paul the 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 guitar player was Mm -hmm. like he was such an electronic tinkerer yeah he took his early and this was like in 1952 1953 yeah he took his les paul and he literally drilled a hole in the front and added a second output it had the side output Mm -hmm. and or input i don't know a jack and he'd plug in multiple cables and he would plug them into different amps and mic them simultaneously Hmm. and so les paul kind of innovated this um uh multiple sound phased uh vibe i'm not like a les paul music fan uh because you know it's just not my genre but ultimately he did some crazy shit with yeah. guitars that made made all of these later guitar heroes made their shit possible yeah and you know iomi is a he's a gibson dude yeah for sure yeah all right so let's go ahead and move on to the uh the next track planet caravan this one um is it, i don't know it's one of those ones that i don't think it was probably popular at the time but it's one of those songs that I think is one of the most, uh, uh, I don't know, underappreciated songs on the yes, album. Yes, yes. I, t- I completely agree. It's a space rock jam. You yeah, know? it's about 
traveling the cosmos with your loved one. Uh huh. It's、yeah. the closest thing to a ballad that they can do. It's just just cruising in space.、It's、music to get high to. <laughs> These are specifically said, nice and relaxing, good to get stoned to. Yeah. <laughs> it's, and let's think about it, like they are really making the blueprint. For the stoner doom metal, oh yeah, thing every here. stoner doom band loves Sabbath. Yeah, and so it's just like it's super spacey. You know, Hawkwind's gonna go on to make a career of just、uh, doing these. Yeah, songs. yeah. <laughs> Hawkwind took Planet Caravan and remixed it for several albums. <laughs> yeah, and and I just I dig that. I like Hawkwind, by the way. Yeah, me too. And it's、uh, it's very jazzy, very spacey. Uh, it's a time traveling song for me. Like I can、mm-hmm. really like. It's a headphones jam, and I can put my headphones on and be sixteen、mm-hmm. w- out walking to my friend's house and just listening to this and just being like vibing on it. Yeah. yeah. So it's that's like, funny. There's certain songs for me that are that way that are that are deep cuts like、mm-hmm. like Trapped Under Ice by Metallica.、Mm-hmm. That, that's this song for me.、Um, not that they have anything musically in common, but、right. one thing that I loved about watching the documentary on this、mm-hmm. was how he would lower the sliders and you got to hear Ozzy's isolated vocals during this performance.、Yeah. And、um, his, lot- his scratch vocal, right? This、yeah. is with his improvised、mm-hmm. lyrics and. One thing that a lot of people will criticize this era of Black Sabbath for is Ozzy being the weakest link.、Uh-huh. Um, like the other one, the other three members are pretty.、Um, I don't. I wouldn't say virtuoso, but I would call them natural talents.、Uh-huh. But Ozzy is really kind of a. He's bumble fucking his way through this, <laughs> and he's the、yeah. first one to admit it. He、yeah. can barely read English, let alone music. <laughs> right. And so he, he didn't want to even learn anything about theory because he didn't want to lose his natural approach. Right. And、um, listening to his raw, kind of soulful、um, uh, scratch tracks. And then, of course, listening to the the real version, the、mm-hmm. album version, I think this might be his best performance on the album. Yeah, and it's it's kind of amazing. And Geezer points it out in in the background information that generally Ozzy came up with the vocal melody, just improvised it,、mm-hmm. and they went with the first go. You know, and it's like,、yeah. and he just would like just be vibing to the song, and he, you know. Even though not many of his lyrics make it into the final version, the th- the thematics of it make it in. Yeah, like Geezer will choose like one or two words that Ozzy said,、yeah. and he'll riff all the lyrics off of that. Yeah, like what's the I like that the lyric the original lyric where he says the moon like a big red bun. <laughs> and yeah. It's like, okay, well, that doesn't. We're gonna go with the moon. The moon. We're keeping the moon. <laughs> But the moon is really not like a big red bun. That's a weird. <laughs> that's a weird lyric. <laughs> yeah. That, <laughs> so I think I definitely think this is one of Ozzy's best performances,、mm-hmm. and、um, it's interesting when you hear. So hearing the raw scratch tracks、mm-hmm. and hearing the actual, I guess, the soul of his voice. Yeah. And then hearing the p- final produced,、um, produced lyrical. Part you can tell that there's some filters on it. It's、yeah. definitely like he's singing through some water or something. So they they recorded him through a Leslie speaker,、uh, which is the sort of contraption that's inside of a Hammond organ,、hmm. and it's a rotating baffle in、oh, front of、okay. a loudspeaker. That's really cool. Yeah, and so it gives it that that sound, that、kind、choppy, da 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 da, and it's watery vibe. And it's got a couple different speeds on it because I think. I think they use the Leslie speaker again for the I am Iron Man, but at a different speed of the baffle spinning. Yeah. Okay.、Um, so, and maybe maybe that's how they did the distortion on the on the last、oh, yeah, song too. The, <laughs> they、yeah. might have just been using the shit out of this Leslie speaker. That's true. And it's interesting, like going back to the how they wrote the lyrics.、Mm-hmm. That's exactly how I do it. But I am just I am Ozzy and Geezer.、Mm-hmm. I <laughs> I riff on the melody and I just say stupid shit or、yeah. what, or nothing at all.、Mm-hmm. Just and, sounds. And and then when I get the cadence and vibe. Um, or melody, dare I say,、mm-hmm. uh, as a, as a metal vocalist,、um, yeah. I then take that and I go back and I add、uh, 
I guess, poetic lyrics or yeah. whatever to what I came up with. So I totally understand their dynamic because mm-hmm. I do both parts of it. Yeah. Um, and I have worked with in a previous band, I worked with another person who would do the geezer role. Yeah. Take your, take, your vibes and, and, and write make it words poetry. to it. Yeah. yeah. I've worked with someone who did that. So it was, it's really interesting. Um, but kind of moving on, I got to say like, the the jazzy solo the Django uh-huh. Reinhardt vibes yeah. were just ah uh, chef's kiss it's just so perfect it's I gotta say and I'm glad you said that because it's in it was in the running for my favorite solo mm-hmm. and and then I was like yeah you know, like you're doing that thing where you're picking the weird one you're just picking the <laughs> weird one to be a weird guy that's true that is your thing <laughs> <laughs> and it'd be like no one expects me to pick Planet Caravan. <laughs> <laughs> But it's really good. <laughs> it well, really yeah. is really good. And I listened to Django Reinhardt because I wasn't familiar mm-hmm. with him. Because um, I don't I don't really think of guitar as a jazz instrument. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it uh, is jazz. <laughs> right. And it's it's very, um, you know, because of my limited, my limited jazz knowledge, what it reminds me of is like the neo swing music from the from the nineties. Sure. Because they always had guitar players in those bands. Yeah, yeah. And it's that kind of that kind of jazz guitar. And it's it's pretty Cause it's pretty they're, dope. Because they're vibing on the roots. You yeah, know? They're they're totally. looking at the old school jazzy players. Yeah. I, and just watching Tony Iommi play this stuff, mm-hmm. um versus watching him do like, you know, choppy power chord riffs and stuff. Yeah. It's it's really cool just to see, you know, see a master at work. He's so good. He's so, uh, I guess, eloquent in his playing. Yeah. He doesn't need too many notes in order to make the song sound right. Yeah. He's not an over player like he's, a lot of people. He kind of has a technique because he's he's a, playing his own his own rhythm guitar yeah. to the thing about like letting the one note ring and then playing over the top of it yeah himself. you know who does that all the time is um uh adam from tool oh okay. always that's like a huge thing that he pulls okay. from black sabbath is he lets a string ring as he's playing his own solos because they you know only one guitar in yeah. the band so you have to kind of be your own backup and the reason we mentioned django reinhardt being such an influence on him is because django reinhardt also chopped off two of his fingers uh, yeah. in an industrial accident. So yeah, these two guys that have maimed hands mm-hmm. became amazing world-renowned guitar players. Yeah, and I saw in the uh, thing I was watching last night where Iomi he talked about how he made his little finger pads that yeah. he wears on his fingers. And he said, I took a squeezy bottle and I melted it down and shaped it into a ball. And I took a soldering iron and bored a hole in it. And then I put it on my finger and I sanded it all down and then put a patch of leather on it so it would grip the string. And then that was how he made his little finger nubs. Yeah, yeah, because he wears self-made finger prosthetics mm-hmm. on the tips of his fingers because he cut them off in an industrial accident. Yeah. It's crazy, like, how cool and how innovative that is. Yeah, and it's it's funny. The, the, the National Health Service in England seems like they were no help at all to him. <laughs> yeah. Like, he's like, I need prosthetics. And they're like, no, bag it. You, you're never going to play guitar again. It's like, uh, no, I'm pretty dedicated to playing guitar. <laughs> I just need things for the ends of my fingers. And then, psh, nope not covered <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're, you're fine so we haven't played it we haven't played a, a moment from here so let's go ahead and uh listen to his little uh django solo nice cut that off but that that solo is like half the song so we, <laughs> yeah it's a it's it's a multiple minute solo it's, yeah it's kind of a jam yeah and that's um the you know that comes out of that time at the star club and playing 45 minute sets and just stretching songs out and just grooving and 
I mean, he's everyone's so good. Everyone's killing it. And like Bill Ward with the with the hand drumming, mm-hmm, the congas on the congas. Yeah, oh yeah. I called them bongos in my notes, and then I was like, oh no, there's these are the tall ones. The congas yeah. are the tall the tall drums. Uh, yeah, it's so good. I just love that song. Yeah, it's it's a really good one, and I and and I would be remiss if I didn't um, uh, also mention the cover because I loved that album. Nativity oh, for the, Pan- the Pantera, Pantera cover. cover, yeah, yeah. That's might be the best song on that that tribute album because uh, oh, it's, oh no no it's not on Nativity. Oh, is it it's not? on Far Beyond Driven. It's on a oh, it's yeah, on a right. Pantera album. But that gets played on the radio. I think the Pantera cover gets played more than the original on radio stations. Well, because I think because Pantera was so hard um, that there wasn't necessarily too many things that they could play on the radio yeah. or whatever. And Planet Caravan was uh, an accessible Pantera track. And Phil really changes up his vocal vibe uh-huh. on it. And it's, it's great. And, of course, Dimebag Daryl just just yeah he makes the solos his own he Uh noodles a lot (laughs) it 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 does the same thing for far beyond driven that it does for paranoid which Mm -hmm. is like gives you a break from the from the percussion and from like the getting pounded in the face sure well i mean for pantera it's the getting pounded in the face for for black sabbaths it's the ultimate sadness (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah totally totally and um and i mentioned it earlier but i'll say it again it's such a headphone jam mm-hmm. because the the sound travels from the right to left channel. Yeah, yeah, it's mastered really well, and it, it gives you that um, like traveling through space, like the Silver Surfer, and you've got like planetoids like flying past you or whatever. It gives you that sense of movement. Yeah, it's and, yeah, it's just well done. It's Love a really it. really great song. So the next one might be. I don't know, maybe the most famous Black Sabbath song, Iron Man. I think so. I mean, I'll be honest, it's what brought me to the party. And uh, it actually, it wasn't the hearing the song. It was hearing Beavis and Butthead uh, <laughs> sing the riff to the song. And I had a friend, uh, Tony, who was a more more studied on classic rock than me and i would hear little bits of songs on tv shows and stuff mm-hmm. and i would come to school and be like like parrot them back i would parrot him back and i was like what song is this and he's like oh that's a parrot or that's a iron man by black sabbath and then that's what made me go and buy the tape because i was like i liked beavis and butthead saying it that riff so much that it made me want to yeah. go listen to it I love how it opens up with the big bands like, yeah, those super slinky strings mm-hmm. that he uses, and and Geezer bends his bass strings so much, it's awesome. Yeah, my um, Lisa reminded me of this. I hadn't thought about it for a long time, but um, my childhood best friend died in a car wreck uh, when we were teenagers, and they we played this, or they, his family, played this song at his funeral. And hmm. it's the funniest to hear this in like a in like a chapel, where everyone's somber and quiet, and you hear that uh, you know, the pastor kind of intros it like, and uh, the family has selected a, a piece of music that was very meaningful for Jason, <laughs> and then you and you hear that kick drum, dum, 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 and we're all all my Hesher friends were all looking at each other like, no way, <laughs> like this isn't about to happen. <laughs> and you're like oh they're playing black sabbath at a church this is amazing <laughs> so yeah it's it's cool yeah I, I love how when they were writing the lyrics for this like uh tony was like playing the guitar part mm-hmm. in the other room and geezer and ozzy were hanging out and ozzy was like sounds like a big iron bloke walking about <laughs> And he's like, I don't think Iron Bloke works. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They it said they use it as a placeholder title for a while. Like you can see that in the notes, Iron Bloke. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 Ozzy uh, went on record, you know, and it's obviously no mystery to anyone that's listened to him. Mm-hmm. When he's not sure exactly what melody he wants to do, he sings the guitar riff. Mm-hmm. Just follows it. Yeah, and that's what he did here. He just sings the guitar riff. And that's very, I mean, that's a well that so many punk rock vocalists have gone to, right? Oh, yeah. it's, that's why how influential in that kind of, you know, that kind of music this all was because that's, that, that 
da 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 you know just like just on the beat yeah that kind of shouted vocal and he's even and he's even matching he's matching the notes and the and the tones Mm -hmm. uh, pretty well he's got a great ear for that for the harmony and for like because he doesn't like you said he doesn't know keys and notes and everything but he can he can get there just with kind it. of fit it in naturally mm-hmm. yeah and i like how geezer was like so interested in sci-fi stuff and so he kind of made this like a sci-fi song but it's mm-hmm. also like a social commentary song yeah and it's just it's it's really cool like this this is a song that uh it's kind of it, it's got it's got a few layers to it totally it's very it's a very meta song because it is the the surface it's almost like a RoboCop kind of character, yeah. right? Um, and it's this this guy, and he's turned into Iron Man, and he's and he's sent to the future to fight for humanity's future. And then what he's, he's kind of Terminator. What he sees in the future makes him want to come back and kill everyone in the past, mm-hmm. which that's a cool concept on its own. But there's another read on it, or at least I've always had another read on it that it's all kind of a delusion, and this is. Uh, like a a, tra- a traumatized veteran, um, mm-hmm. and the you know the the future war is just a metaphor for the the going to Vietnam and coming back, and coming back and wanting to wanting to lash out at the people there. Yeah, send him for sure. When they talk about you know we'll just pass him there. Why should we even care? It's like that's how we treat the homeless veterans on the on the side of the road, basically. Mm-hmm. And so yeah, it's got it's got multiple layers to it and it just really holds up and this was one of those ones another one where they play the isolated tracks and it, and mm-hmm. it really just kind of highlights how how locked in geezer bill and tony were how they were yeah. just they were just kind of like a single unit they were mm-hmm. so it, they were so tight it, it's astonishing that they recorded this live <laughs> that this right. wasn't people doing take after take locking into a click track mm-hmm. you know it just it's crazy how this was done live and not uh not individual yeah and henry rollins calls out uh the bridge at the end of it and on the classic albums Mm -hmm. and you 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 basically you come out of the solo and go into this bridge and it's like a a descending bridge that plays the riff goes through twice and then it shifts into an ascending bridge and then back into the original riff again and it's just kind of this really cool transition from solo to the bridge to the outro yeah and that part is that part's really rad and i i could sing it for you guys here but it's better we, we should just listen to it we should play it talk, yeah, yeah instead of <laughs> instead of us going like dan it dan it i mean that might be a fun episode <laughs> if we just do acapella we, versions of all the songs oh man <laughs> we could do four four tracks <laughs> <laughs> and vocally do all of the tracks of the song. <laughs> oh man, I guess I'm gonna call uh, Tony and, and Bill. <laughs> you could be Geezer and Ozzy. Mm. Perfect. <laughs> that is the perfect arrangement. <laughs> I love we we that way we get a repeat of that uh, opening in, or the opening riff there. So mm-hmm. we did get to have our cake and eat it too that time. Well, like the opening verse, I do love how the song bookends with the intro as mm-hmm. the outro with those big bends. So this song does a lot of things that I that I do and I like when mm-hmm. I hear like songs that bookend the intro and the outro. I like reprising but changing mm-hmm. your your uh, main riff kind of a variation on a theme. I like that whole vibe. Yeah. This song is um this song is probably their most famous song and it's good i mean there's there's no reason it shouldn't be Mm -hmm. oh yeah i love it so much and it i love uh you know geezer talks about the things that he was conceived no one no one was 
talking about the things I was concerned with, like the environment and politics. He's like, and hippie stuff. Huh? Yeah, and he <laughs> does the little piece of it. He's yeah. like, hippie. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I love the, the Birmingham accent. I find it very charming. Rob yeah. Halford has that same accent. And uh, yeah. Um, it's just a good song, and this is the the closing track of the first side of the LP. Yeah, that was side that was side A, and I guess they they really just wanted to put four bangers on there. Yeah, War Pigs, Paranoid, Planet Caravan, and Iron Man. Uh, so good. That's a jam. If that's if that's just like an EP, it rules. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's untouchable. Yeah, those four songs are amazing. Mm-hmm. And then it moves into um, a very underrated song, Electric Funeral. Um, I love how this song uh, is really just, it's all all about this like um, war scare, atomic fear. Mm-hmm. The lyrics are super straightforward. They're not yeah. trying to hide the ball. Um, and the guitar, vocals, bass, and all of that are all just locked in. Mm-hmm. Like Electric Funeral is, it's like everyone singing the same song. Yeah. And it's, it's heavy, right? Like, and I mean thematically heavy it's a nuclear mm. armageddon it's it's like the holocaust um but it is also jazzy and it's a mm-hmm. it's a bop like it is it's like one of the it's a one of the groovier songs too. yeah because they they do some big like tempo changes mm-hmm. and they really kind of um they do this thing i always um i always refer to sabbath like when i'm jamming with my band or whatnot and i'm like let's let's do like a sabbath like a hard left turn you know like where you change tempos and you change it's almost like a different song in the same song yeah they do that in this song and they do it in the next song big time there's a whole interlude that's like a different song yeah they do it in planet caravan yeah like it it really there's a lot of these parts where it it almost feels like there's different songs kind of stacked together Mm -hmm. because they workshopped them so much. They were able to make those transitions sound smooth and Mm -hmm. uh, cool. They made it kind of dramatic and not abrupt. Yeah. And a word that comes up a lot when people are describing Sabbath is menace. Mm -hmm. You know, the menace that's in Ozzy's vocal and the menace in Iomi's guitar playing. And there's really menace in Bill Ward's drums too. Um, this is a menacing song. Yeah. This one is, um, this one is a, I guess a deeper cut. Like this Mm -hmm. is, this is something that like, um, doom fans and other, you know, Mm -hmm. like more, more like if you see someone with an electric funeral shirt, you're like, Mm -hmm. okay, that person's pretty cool. (laughs) Like it's, it's a, it's one of those more niche songs. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's what you do on side two. Yeah, you know, because you get a little weird. Because some of the the, the softies are only going to play side one; they're never going to flip the record over. This is for the real heads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this this song. I mean, Electric Funeral and Hand of Doom mm-hmm. are criminally underrated songs. Um, they could have been side one songs. Yeah, I think so. And um, you know, I think this is a nice transition from Iron Man too, because you can almost, if you imagine. Th- this is almost like you're getting to see the future that Iron Man saw that made him so mad that he came back to kill everyone. Yeah, this song is basically about desolation. It's mm-hmm. it's really gnarly. This is not a uh, this is this is not one like Planet Caravan where mm-hmm. you can just kind of space out and love yeah. who you want. <laughs> you know. Uh, I don't know. I don't have a part of this song kind of in mind to play. So why don't we, let's give it a listen and we'll find a cool cut for you guys. Yeah, I think I want to do one of those parts where it feels like they're all chanting at the same time. Like Mm. the guitar, the bass, the vocals, the whole thing. To me, that kind of this, that almost mantra of electric funeral kind of defines this song. Yeah, and he does, he does like metal vocals there. It's one of the times when he goes, electric funeral. Yeah, (laughs) it's it's kind of dark. I really like that part of this song. So let's check it out. Okay, let's pull that.
you know, that's another one, like, that's the mosh part. Mm -hmm. Like, that's the circle pit. That's when people start running. And narratively, that's when the shit hits the fan. Like, this is after the bomb has dropped. And this is, like, where people are running around melting and and stuff. Yeah, I love how uh, how the the guitar... It kind of has this jazzy, chordy vibe to mm-hmm. it. It's a, uh, it's not super metal, but it's hard hitting, and yeah. so it has. It kind of has an evil vibe to it. Yeah, it's it's swinging. You know, like that's yeah. a. Uh, I think Rollins called that out in the in the documentary where he says that the the rhythm section really swings, and they oh, do. Yeah. Like this is groovy. It's swinging. It's jazzy, but it is Armageddon into the world. Everyone's going to die. I mean, I like Doom, Mm -hmm. but I like Doom that has groove to it a lot better than just slow, heavy funeral Doom. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean. How many kinds of Doom are there? And does Sabbath, are they the prototype of every one of them? I think so. (laughs) I'm pretty (laughs) sure. Like, yeah, funeral Doom, they're definitely the start of stoner Doom, Mm -hmm. like, for sure. But I'm, you know, I don't know. They're (laughs) they're not that melodic Doom, like that trad Doom. Oh. Um, but I don't know. They're they're uh, they're pretty huge in that genre. But yeah. let's speaking of Doom, how about the Hand of Doom? Oh yeah, good one. This song, uh, sixth track, second track on the set, uh, second side B, I should say, mm-hmm. and it's seven minutes long, eight seconds. And this one is criminally underrated. I guess I say that about all of them. But basically, this sinister rift kind rift mm-hmm. kind of like slithers in, and it has this vibe to it. Mm-hmm. Um, this was all about vietnam soldiers getting super fucked up on drugs and mm-hmm. and whatnot just to be able to stay there and stay sane and then coming home addicted and how it's just darkness yeah and i kept thinking like because england is not involved in the war and it's like what is the connection to vietnam for them and i think it's geezer talks about it how there was uh on the military bases in Europe, mm-hmm. there were these halfway houses, one in England and one in Germany, yep. that they would send the soldiers to to reacclimate to civilian life before sending them back home to America. Yeah, and so that gave it gave the the Sabbath guys kind of access to these fucked up servicemen who were dealing with that. Especially, f- all wars are fucked up, but that's an especially fucked up one yeah and rollins says about this song he says on the paranoid record there are some downer themes but find the part that's not true yeah (laughs) it's it's so true and then somebody else says sabbath doesn't preach but they do observe yeah and i love that about them how they they have this kind of observational bleakness Uh uh-huh and it's i mean it's just it's it's not saying it's not making a value judgment right where it's not saying you uh you're bad for getting into heroin but it is saying i mean it it will be your undoing mm-hmm. like it that's just the predictable result of it but it's not a like a moral judgment it's more of like a just look at look at this yeah it, it's really they're shining a spotlight on a super fucked up thing mm-hmm. and uh, they just want it to not be fucked up, you know. Yeah. It's um, it's it's interesting. I thought that it was also interesting that this is um, Bill Ward's favorite song, hmm. um, and he's, he's got a lot to do on it. Yeah, and he said basically that the the bass line is the core of this song, and mm-hmm. that's why he likes playing along with it so much. Yeah, and this is one of those ones. Uh, well, it's got yeah, it's got that cool bass intro, and it's one of those ones where it's like. There's the first song, yeah. then there's an interlude song, and then we revisit the first song. Because I always, the the last third of Hand of Doom, I always am sort of like, oh yeah, it's still Hand of Doom. Because it yeah, yeah. feels, that middle part feels so distinct. Like it's It feels its like thing. a different song, yeah. yeah. And I think on a record, if... You know, in back in the day, there was no shuffle. Yeah. You know, there was no uh, a la carte. There were not really playlists before mm-hmm. mixtapes. And so this, you would listen to the record because there was no single of this. And yeah. so, you know, it could have been three songs or it could have been whatever. It, but it actually didn't matter mm-hmm. because of the format. You yeah. were forced to listen to it in this order. Yeah, you're listening to it all the way through. 
And if you're on side B, you mm-hmm. know, you're, you're, you're committed. <laughs> you're already in it. Yeah. Um, I, I also want to comment on Ozzy's vocals here and he really has kind of a really deliberate and stylistic delivery. It's, mm-hmm. it's very much his own thing. Like yeah. nobody sounds like Ozzy and Ozzy doesn't sound like anyone else. You know, and they say that about Tony Iommi too. Like no one plays like him. Mm-hmm. There's, these are very, even though there's multiple subgenres based off of this, no one really sounds like these dudes. Uh, yeah, I agree. This is, this is kind of like its own unique thing. Mm-hmm. So let's listen to that cool bass intro because I don't think we've had enough geezer. Oh, for sure. Um, and, and then we can uh, move on to the next one. Yeah, that'll give us a little what you're going to do from Ozzy too. Yeah. yeah i mean there's that that word menace comes back up it's it's so menacing sounding this the intro of this song yeah that's why i really like that uh how that riff kind of creeps like Mm -hmm. the guitar part and I, i feel like the the bass line, it's, I don't know, it just has this, this interesting sort of swingy vibe. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's, it's just really interesting to me. I really like Hand of Doom. I think it's a, um, a good song that has a lot of nuance to it. It's, and, it's, you know, we talked about on the last track the, about Black, no, we, I guess it was in the run up to this one, that Black Sabbath doesn't judge, but they observe. Mm-hmm. And you do kind of, you almost feel, feel like you're getting walked around a shooting gallery you know what i mean like with your you're being let into this dark world of these uh you know heroin heroin addicted vets yeah and you're just like watching them you know is sort of like scrooge with the the ghost of christmas past or whatever like it's it's very you know, I don't ominous. I don't, I don't know how to describe it, but it's, you're being let in on something dark. Yeah. It's, it's very sinister and it's awesome. I love it. So the next track, number seven is called rat salad and it's an instrumental track. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's probably the least played song for me. It was never, it's it's never one of those songs that gets, uh, put on playlists or on covers or played on the radio or anything like that. So the only time you hear Rat Salad is when you're listening to this whole album front to back because it's the second to last out, uh, song. Yeah, and they don't even really cover it in yeah, the, they don't in talk the, about it in the all. classic albums because it's one of those jams. So this is uh, the product of letting Bill Ward essentially lead the jam for 45 minutes yeah this this song has a beginning uh it has a cool kind of mid-range melody Mm -hmm. in it it's it's not really a guitar solo um and it's got this cool kind of marching beat yeah and then all of a sudden it takes you know another one of those hard left turns and it's just a drum solo yeah and it's you You never see those on albums you see it live sometimes Mm -hmm. but this is like okay the drummer wanted a minute and in this case (laughs) about two minutes (laughs) yeah i i said to paraphrase the great chuck d uh, let the drummer get wicked because that's what that's what this is this is just like stand back and everyone's supporting the drummer as a normally the drummer supports everyone else yeah this is everyone supporting bill ward to just fucking rock yeah he's a killer drummer Mm -hmm. and he really uh is he he's a great example of a drummer who mostly plays to serve the music Mm -hmm. not to serve his own uh, ego yeah but this is sort of his moment to just sort of stand head and shoulders above and be like okay look at what i can do yeah and the title is inspired by bill ward too or at least allegedly uh because he had such unkempt hair uh, oh. He had a rat's nest, and so that's where the the rat salad came from. Bill's ratty hair. Interesting. Yeah, I don't love this song for just easy listening. It's a <laughs> fucking drum solo. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't really put this. Uh, I mean, I obviously it's on the album, but yeah. this isn't what you think of when you think of uh, Paranoid. That's true. It. I mean, it all sort of 
bleeds together because uh, track four starts with kind of a long instrumental part too. Yeah. And so Hand of Doom through all the way through Rat Salad and into the Jack the Stripper portion of Fairies Wear Boots is all kind of just like one big stoner jam. Yeah. This uh, side two of this album is less, um, it's less, uh, I I guess I should say it's more cohesive as a single side Mm -hmm. and it's less individual songs. These are not singles. You couldn't really choose Rat Salad or Fairies Wear Boots as singles. They're not really good for that. It wouldn't work. But it it does, I think, give you an idea of what seeing them at the Star Club and catching one of their 45-minute jams is like this second half of the album or the the back third is very much like watching one of those jams i imagine yeah i like um i like this song but it's it's just one of those ones where it's just like uh i wouldn't put this on a playlist <laughs> well let's pull out i don't know pull out we'll, we'll, find, a, we'll, we'll find we'll find a cool drum fill yeah we got to have a we got to have bill ward get his moment It's a short one, but the rest there's about a minute and a half in there that's just drums, mm-hmm. no guitar, no bass, nothing. Just I, drums. Yeah. I like this part where it's a call and response, very bluesy. Um I always guitar riff reminds me of Electric Funeral, like it's almost like kind a callback yeah. to that. And and I just like the call and response part of it where he plays he plays a riff and then Bill does a fill. Mm-hmm. And I like that part of the song. Yeah, I think that's pretty cool too. That's it's kind of a highlight moment. Mm-hmm. So the last song on the album is called Fairies Wear Boots. And it it has a section of it that's uh, referred to as uh, Jack the Stripper, the yeah. first part of it. And the Jack the Stripper and Luke's Wall on the opening track on, Pigs, on yeah. War Pigs are I think names for the instrumental parts. Yeah. But they're not listed on the album. That's in like the new digital version of things that those get called out. Yeah. Those are sort of their internal names for those sections. Mm-hmm. And that's cool that they have those. So yeah, this is, this is fairy wear boots. And this is, this is kind of one of those songs that, um, has a super long intro. Mm-hmm. The, and it's the a Jack lost art. Yeah. It's a, it's a lost art. Bands don't really do this anymore. Nobody has patience to wait for a vocal to start yeah. like a few minutes in. Mm-hmm. And I, I love that actually. Yeah. And it just, that goes to their, to their time jamming at the star club, really mm-hmm. that they, they have all of these instrumental jams. And then um, they get into this like swing part mm-hmm. that it's almost, it's almost like a shuffle yeah. drum piece. It's so good. Yeah. And I suppose we need to talk about, Southern fairies, because <laughs> oh, yeah. cause that's the the origin of the title. Fairies wear boots. Uh, people in the north call people in the south southern fairies. Well, and people in the south call people in the north northern bastards. The internet says northern monkeys. Well, my f- <laughs> uh, my friend Al is from Southampton, mm-hmm. and he introduced me to the concept of the yeah. northern uh, the southern fairies and the northern bastards because he himself is a southern is a fairy. southern fairy. Yeah. So yeah, this is just sort of a a thing they call each other. They mm-hmm. have a little ri- rivalry. It's like East Coast West Coast in the U S. That yeah. kind of thing. And it's you know uh, people in the South. I mean, it, there's no getting around that this is a homophobic thing. There's a homophobic connotation to it, but it's generally uh, the 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 more politically correct term that's evolved is Southern softies, mm-hmm. um, which is has less of that connotation. And and this song, like the lyrics, they were originally was Ozzy had an encounter with skinheads and he was making fun of them by calling them fairies Mm -hmm. because they were wearing boots and whatnot. And so he was basically, he was trying to thumb his nose at skinheads with this song. Yeah. And there's a few things. So it's more than just Ozzy. This was uh, a pretty, it's a pretty legendary uh, band gang fight. Mm-hmm. that happened um where they got jumped uh by a, a gang of skinheads and we should say that these kind of skinheads late 60s early 70s skinheads 
this is much more like the kids Boba Fett recruited in episode three of Book of Boba Fett mm-hmm. than the sort of white nationalist that stormed the capital. You know, it's hmm. it's hard mods. It's not neo Nazis. Yeah, they're wearing like button up cardigan shirts and yeah. like tight jeans and stuff. And Ozzy's only like three years removed from being a skinhead himself at at this point. Yeah, um, and 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 he has just sort of become a lot more hippie stoner. Mm-hmm. Guy. He's, he's evolved out of out of that look. Um, and but this is a pretty brutal fight they got into. Um, and you know, at some point, it said Ozzy was wielding a hammer, and there was much bloodshed in this huh. in this battle. Um, and then ultimately, they called the skinheads fairies. That was kind of the the diss that they had amongst themselves. Yeah. But then it gets spun into like a bluesy fantasy song where about drugs and yeah, various stuff. Where he's sort of hallucinating fairies in boots dancing with a dwarf. Uh and then ultimately goes like, you know, goes to the to the doctor to be like, you know, like I'm seeing fairies in boots. What can what can you do for me? Yeah, I don't I think this was not the best work uh lyrically. I think <laughs> Geezer really should have taken over here. Um <laughs> And it is, um, yeah, this is an Aussie jam. This is not a geezer one. Yeah, the geezer lyrics are much stronger than the Aussie lyrics. Um, Fair. I'll, I'll have to give you that. <laughs> and and so this was, yeah, this was one of those ones where they they took a real life event and then they spun it into something different. Mm-hmm. And um, it's interesting to me, like, how this was, this is kind of, um, it was almost like a statement, like, we're we're hard we're we're tough we're Mm -hmm. we're not we're not weak people Mm -hmm. or whatever um i don't i i mean they use different words back then people (laughs) the word fairy the word fairy it may have it may have had a little bit of uh a a little bit of a connotation but it wasn't like the same thing as today i guess or maybe just that it was a little more acceptable maybe they could have said sissies or that's homophobic too is it i don't know it's so uh, i mean Um, weak uh effeminate which is pretty bad yeah all of those things i mean it's just, there's not, you can't fix it, but it is no. a product of its time. Yeah, I think, and, I think in, in retro, like if you talked to Tony or I guess Ozzy, mm-hmm. I don't think he's homophobic. No. Um, and he was grasping for something to call these guys that they would hate. Uh huh. Because he knew they would hate being called that. He, that's yeah. what he called them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm not trying to apologize for the or late sixties, but yeah. I just think that this isn't malicious. But one thing that was pointed out kind of, uh, at, by Rollins is this is kind of a, almost like a statement of who they are. Um, yeah. that, you know, if you go to a party and there's four guys hanging out outside <laughs> and they're drinking or smoking weed, those are the black Sabbath fans. They're yeah. not the ones inside dancing. <laughs> they're the they're the lonely stoners that would rather party in the woods. Yeah, I love that. The the they congregate and party in the woods. Yeah. <laughs> That's totally true. This is down and out music. This isn't dancing music. Mm-hmm. And and this this kind of is almost like a mission statement song, like we're not like you in the in the title and in intent, even though his Ozzy's actual lyrics don't really match that. Um, the way they talk about when they were writing and creating the song, mm-hmm. that was the vibe they were getting out of it. Yeah, and I think that vibe does carry through. And um, this is a song really that's probably grown on me a lot over okay. the over the years. Where I didn't necessarily dig it on the first listen, but now uh, I do enjoy this song quite a bit. Yeah, it, I mean it's it's a really good song uh, that that takes it takes some growing it doesn't start (laughs) off sounding amazing unless you just love super long intros like me (laughs) yeah and it uh it it is it it tell i I like story like folk songs do like storytelling you know like take you on a journey you should hear this band called led zeppelin (laughs) led zeppelin (laughs) takes you on some journeys they don't always make sense (laughs) (laughs) but it, it does take you on a journey um yeah so i i like this song and i don't know what part you want to pull the Oof, um it's a tough one maybe probably maybe, the went to the doctor part i mean yeah i'll let you pick i would just choose part of uh the, jack of the, the stripper long... intro but that's just me we can we'll... well we could do jack the stripper into the coming home late one night sounds good let's pull that up
So the lyric after that follows that, where he's, fairies were boots, fairies with boots were dancing with the dwarf. Mm-hmm. I've never understood what they were dancing with until uh, watching it with the captioning on TV, and I was like, "With a dwarf!" <laughs> <laughs> like, and it's like I've never known what that lyric was because he like he slurs it so much. Yeah, Ozzy is pretty incomprehensible in general, and <laughs> uh, when he's singing, it can get even worse. Yeah, he's like, oh, the storm <laughs> yeah. and he, he mumbles through everything, yeah. Yeah. He, so it's, what's that dwarf? <laughs> you know, and it just sort of distorts. Yeah, he's definitely a mumbler, and mm-hmm. all of this on, on uh, analog audio tape, it's mm-hmm. not crisp. All right, so that's all eight of the tracks of this classic album. Mm-hmm. Um, did you have any anything you wanted to add before we get into our final thoughts, or uh, our, 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 our um, you know what worked, what didn't work, and all that? Um, let's see. No, no, because every anything I would say right now is something that that will come up in my end of my final thoughts. So that's, All right, so that's let's totally go fine. ahead. You want to go ahead and we, we told each other that we were going to choose favorite songs with an honorable mention and mm-hmm. our favorite solos. So let's do that before our final, what worked for you and all of that. So, um, what was your favorite song in your honorable mention? Okay. All right, let's go favorite song, favorite song. Nah, nah, do both of yours. Go okay. Ahead. So my favorite song and I really like hemmed and hot over this because It just feels like such a pedestrian choice to say Mm -hmm. Iron Man. But I've listened to this album so much and then, you know, just recreationally and then over this last week listening to it uh, academically. Yeah. And I just can't pick anything else. It's Iron Man is my my favorite song. Um, And then honorable mention... uh, I'd be cheating if I did too, but uh, I'll just have to say it's paranoid. I, okay. I really Planet Caravan. It's almost like a sub honorable mention. I wanted to get it in there somehow. So you you go you go with Iron Man and Paranoid. How mainstream of you? I know. Listen I, to this loser. I know. So it's true because it's Rat Salad and my, Planet Caravan. My favorite song <laughs> is Planet Caravan. Oh, nice. And my honorable mention is Hand of Doom. Mm, those are good. So good track. Those. Are, I mean, the thing is, is Planet Caravan your favorite? It really is. It's so good. I've listened to this song. I've listened to this album. I, not. Not as much as I've listened to some of my other teenage albums, but mm-hmm. I, I've certainly listened to it a hundred times. I think mm-hmm. that that that's easily true. And whenever Planet Caravan comes on, my brain just goes into a different place. It's just a magical song, like, it is. and I don't I don't say that lightly or yeah. whatever. But it's just it has an effect on me. It's transcendent. It's like it really does take it takes you on a journey. Yeah, it's it's the best song on this album, and it's the least metal, and that's mm-hmm. okay. Um, and I just I love it. And the reason I chose Hand of Doom because I mean I could have chosen Electric Funeral or War Pigs or Paranoid. I mean mm-hmm. I love all of those mm-hmm. songs, but I chose Hand of Doom just because it's so underrated. It yeah. never gets the love it deserves, and it's just it's so strong. It could mm-hmm. have been a side one song. Mm-hmm. It's it's just criminally overlooked in yeah. this and it's just it's just heavy as fuck it's yeah. got some great moments and it just never gets its due so i had to i had to give hand of doom some love and it is i think it's the strongest track on side two for yeah sure. for sure that yeah. i mean it definitely could have it could have been on side one mm-hmm. uh if it wasn't seven minutes so that's why it wasn't and then what is your favorite Tony Iommi solo uh, it, on this album? I mean, it's really hard not to say Planet Caravan, but that would be lame. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, so, it's such a soft one. Yeah. That's why that's hard to pick that one. It's, it's not up in your face. It's not doing any of that stuff. So I chose Paranoid. Oh, okay, that cool. solo is so good, which is great that we kind of organically decided to feature the Paranoid solo mm-hmm. uh, when we talked about Paranoid, uh, because it is. I, I chose that last night when I was really <laughs> buckling down, making my decisions, and I just like that solo. It's a short song. It has some urgency to it. It's not a long solo. Yeah, and it just it's just solid. Yeah. After much deliberation, I picked the solo. Uh, 
from war pigs oh okay um, interesting yeah and i was like i was trying to th- analyze myself as i'm listening to it and go for the one uh that i air guitar the hardest to oh, <laughs> when nice. i was like like which is the one that makes you do the sort of the salty licks face and like really groove on the solo <laughs> and so i i ultimately last like actually, I, I don't think I picked it finally until this morning, but I oh. picked the one off War Pigs. Nice. Okay, so what worked for you? What were your personal highlights? My short answer is everything. <laughs> I think this whole album works for me. Every time I listen to the album, which has been a lot of times, when it ends, I think that's it. It's over. Like I'm ready to listen to it again. It, yeah. It it's not hard to it, like. You know, when I would listen to it on a tape, it's just real easy to let the tape start playing again and not switch it out. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I just really like that. And then more specifically, the vibe, the sense of doom, the sense of menace. Um, this is the sound of flower power dying. Oh, and yeah. And it's just like, I just love that atmosphere that Black Sabbath creates. What about you? What what worked for you? I mean, basically, I mean, I could say the same things as you. I wrote down here that I love the themes and mm-hmm. the feel and the dark vibes. This this album kind of resonates mm-hmm. um, just black magic. Mm-hmm. Geezer Butler did his work. Yeah. And I love it. It's so good. And and the other thing that really works for me is how raw and stripped it is. Mm. They don't go in and double guitar tracks. They don't double vocal tracks. They don't add a bunch of crap like modern bands do. Yeah, It's really stripped. And it's really just the essence of these dudes playing together in a live, synergistic atmosphere. Mm-hmm. And you can really feel feel that interplay between them they weren't playing to a click track they were playing to a drummer that Mm -hmm. they all knew so well yeah and so this album has an organic feel to it that is impossible to replace and so um those things really make this album a classic for me definitely i i definitely second all of that so uh what didn't work for you tom i'm I'm very much stretching to to come up with anything. Okay. So here's my two things, uh, or uh, two and a half things that, that didn't work for me. Number one, Planet Caravan thematically doesn't fit. Hmm. It does not have anything to do with war or depression or addiction. It's a total side quest, uh, <laughs> date in space. And even though sonically it's a great bridge between Paranoid and Iron Man, yeah, thematically it's not perfect. It's not a perfect fit. Okay. Still love it. Wouldn't take it out, but just that. Um, I don't like that there's a homophobic connotation in Fairies Wear Boots. Again, just called it Jack the Stripper. That would have worked. Totally. Um, but yeah... I don't like that, but I understand it's a different time, and I think they did sort of redeem it in not making it a homophobic song. It's literally a song about a guy hallucinating fairies. Yeah. So I do think they kind of fixed that. So it's like all of my all of my critiques are answered. Okay. <laughs> and then it's a little front loaded. Side one is stronger than side two. Oh yeah, it's like the black album. Yeah, for sure. Um, but. That's it. And that's really scratching my head to come up with anything to complain about. Hmm. What about you? So I had a few things. Um, firstly, um, side two is just not nearly as good. It hmm. was like f- out of four songs, there's two keepers. Like hmm. I think I think Electric Funeral and Hand of Doom are classics, untouchable, amazing songs. I think including an entire track for a drum solo pretty much. That's very seventies. Uh, is is not necessary. Rat Salad could have been deleted. And I think Jack the Stripper and Fairies Were Boots uh together were uh, just not a very strong song. Hmm. The lyrics were not very good. Yeah. Ozzy uh did not do a good job on those lyrics. 
Hendricks. <laughs> um, and I don't think that the performance was particularly notable. I think there were a lot of musical themes in, in that song that were repeated from like Hand of Doom and Electric Funeral, etc. Kind yeah. of the, the back and forth thing, the start stop thing. Yeah. So I think that the last two tracks of the album are ultimately um, three star tracks on a five star album. Mm. If, if the rest of six out of eight are five five out of fives for me those are three star songs or even two star song for rat salad it's just not a listenable track um it doesn't it's not a bop <laughs> um, yeah i don't i mean i won't argue with you i i definitely understand where you're coming from but it never i've never felt like skipping it hmm. you know what i mean it's long and it i mean it's not that long it's two and a half minutes but two I and a half that, minutes of drumming in your head is yeah. a bit much yeah yeah that's that's a, that's a fair criticism. And it's kind of like two. The side two is like two songs and two jams. Yeah, pretty much. And then my last thing is, um, is not really a criticism of the album, but just a criticism of the band. Is that you have three amaze balls musicians and Ozzy hanging out with them, <laughs> who's just a decent uh, creative type. He's yeah. not actually a very good singer. He just kind of is... He's a personality. Yeah, he's like he's like a David Lee Roth. Mm-hmm. He's just not a, a, a standout musician. He does do some unique things, and his performance on Planet Caravan is really good. Um, but I think that he also does some pretty weak performances here and there hmm. uh, that are not to the standard of the other three guys in the band okay uh so they really are they're like a if they're a four-legged stool one of their one of their legs is weaker than it's the a other. weaker it's just he's he's the least good of them mm. um you're not alone in thinking that i mean i don't agree but you're not alone I mean, almost in thinking that. everybody who's into music <laughs> thinks that dio sabbath is better technically better with with, you know i mean it is different when you have geezer who can write the words and make ozzy sing them it Mm -hmm. has a different vibe than dio doing it himself so i guess i mean i'm not dogging this album i'm just saying those things didn't work they were they were outstanding to me uh that kept this from being um all that it could have been interesting okay so what's your final thought and rating I, this is probably predictable because of what I've been saying. Uh, I said that uh, the Black Album was uh, a four-star double EP or a double LP that could have been a five-star single LP. This is a five-star single LP. I I like it front to back. Interesting. And um, I like how short it is, and not a lot of not a lot of frills on it. It's just uh, short to the point and hard hmm. and to me like this is a this is a stone cold classic all right so so gets the rare five from the Nick. rare five so i gave it a four okay uh because it's almost perfect <laughs> it's basically 30 minutes of perfect metal yeah the first six songs and those are just amazing i just think that the last two are ultimately forgettable and that's why they are forgettable like if you ask people to name black sabbath songs like what songs do you like or whatever Mm -hmm. they never say fairies wear boots or rat salad it's always paranoid iron man war pigs you know like these really amazing songs um and if you ask a, a you know a air quotes true fan for deep cut it's electric funeral or hand of doom right those uh this was three quarters of a perfect album (laughs) and so i have i can't give it a. you can't give it the five i want to give it a five because i love this album but i just don't think it stands with other five star albums okay because of the weak ending if i had only listened to side one and just projected what i think side two is going to be like i would have been like oh fuck me what the hell (laughs) (laughs) but it just didn't end strong started strong and ended it doesn't it ends weak yeah i think you've justified that opinion (laughs) that's what i say even though i don't agree you've made your case all right (laughs) thank you for accepting my rating (laughs) 
<laughs> we'll throw it back. Come well, back the, and deliberate again. <laughs> this is this is come back when it's a five. <laughs> I was I was reading a lot of like review aggregates and stuff, mm-hmm. and it's not the same as for movies, but yeah, this is either a four star or a five star album. Yeah. In every reviewer, like everybody either thinks it's perfect or thinks it's almost perfect. Yeah, and that's pretty much where it lands with us too. Right. So that's, I think normal. it has to do with how much tolerance do you have for uh, a drum, a drummer led track? Because <laughs> <laughs> some people aren't, and they're not there for that. And, immediate, and, and an incomprehensible vocalist who is let loose on the lyrics once or twice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's, you know, that is, uh, where, where's the lie? <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's take a break. Come back with our album choice. All right, welcome back, divers. It's time for that final segment, the one where I ask Dave, what are you into right now? So I struggled on this one a little bit because Mm -hmm. I've been super duper busy with uh, schoolwork and work work and some Mm -hmm. various stuff. I've been trying to fit in some time to do some Warhammer 40K stuff, but I just haven't been able to get any time in. But one thing that's been taking up a little bit of my... uh, you know, my, my time when I have a minute or two is I've been watching this particular YouTube channel. It's mm-hmm. called Trogley's Guitar Show. Trogley's? Yeah. And you should, you should spell that so they can find it. Uh, Trogley. So T-R-O-G-L-Y okay. apostrophe S guitar show. And he actually has a, a website also. Um, but basically he's a guitar guy. He's a nerd, definitely a nerd. He's a little younger than us, I think, but he, um, he does vintage guitar investigations, reviews, teardowns, discussions. He buys and sells guitars. He okay. has his guitar uh, website. He buys and sells vintage guitars, and they're pretty high dollar guitars. Um, and so, like, he'll buy something and he'll do a full like teardown of it. Like, take off all the components, look at each of them see if they're all um you know if it's all vintage if it's all um uh you know if anything's been altered he uses a black light to check fading on the lacquer to see if it's been refinished and oversprayed he looks at the um the wood and the grain and all this stuff he gets really deep into it and this is something i think if you like history and you like building stuff and craftsmanship Mm -hmm. it's easy easily something you can get into like i was chatting with carrie the other day about that how she likes trogley's guitar show better than watching like you know yet another disc golf podcast (laughs) even though she plays disc golf it's just this guy is talking about historical stuff about how things were built in the 70s and 60s and the various things uh historical um impacts of different uh, different guitars and it's just fun. I like it. I'm nerdy for this sort of thing. Yeah. I know it's, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty small, uh, target audience, just kind of nerdy guitar people. But I think if you want to see somebody who does a review on a guitar, this is the guy he, cause he goes down yeah. every little thing. And so I, I Google or I didn't go, I search his channel for mm-hmm. some guitars that I have been interested oh, in for okay. years. And I see his full teardown videos where he literally bought one, tore it down and then sold it, mm-hmm. um, for some, or, or he, he'll act as a broker for somebody and yeah. he'll get it from like Japan or Europe or whatnot. And then okay. he'll, he'll do a full inspection and give you a proper report of all of it and stuff. So it's pretty cool. That seems cool. I don't know what it is about those videos, that kind of video that's so satisfying. Cause I watched like cobbler videos where oh, guys yeah, the dis- boots, disassemble downs, boots. Yeah. Too, yeah. And it's like, there's just something about watching some, uh, a well-crafted item be disassembled mm-hmm. and, and, and look appreciating the levels of craft that went into it. Yeah. Um, it's even if you're, I don't think you have to be necessarily into guitars to find this interest that interesting. Yeah. And there's some really cool stuff they, that they look at. Like there's some, 
old, old, like 1950s Les Pauls that mm-hmm. people modded at the time because there weren't humbucker pickups. So the electric pickups had hum to them. Mm. So humbucking pickups made the, it bucked the hum. So okay. you, they didn't hum anymore. And so people like Les Paul would hollow out a cavity in the middle of the guitar and put in a phantom coil that would silence the hum. And then he would put an additional pick guard over it himself and screw it down so you see some of these 50s modded guitars Uh um, and look at those and explore the reasons why they were modded and how they were done and it's it's just super cool that's really interesting because um it sounds like it shows you uh what things that have become aesthetic uh what the the practical origin of them oh was. yeah and, and and things things that were used to be done for a practical reason that aren't done today because they're just not needed mm-hmm. so when you see some of these like for example the les paul recording guitar that had multiple outputs and multiple controls to control the different outputs i learned all that from the trogli guitar show oh and okay yeah, you, and you used it in yeah, this episode I did. Yeah. so yeah and i know a lot about gibson sgs and stuff too just from mm-hmm. his show um because i've been looking at a baritone gibson sg to add to my collection Mm. at some point Um, just to hang it on the wall no i don't own a baritone guitar so it would be a player for when i need a a down tune stuff so oh okay um that would be my vibe uh for that guitar all right so what about you what are you into right now uh so i've been watching a show on hbo max uh it's peacemaker uh written by james gunn and he's he's directed like five of the i don't know how many episodes are going to be oh, i've been i've had this suggested to me but i haven't watched it, it has john cena right? it has john cena as as the the titular peacemaker and it's a it's spinning out of the suicide squad which is uh distinct from the suicide squad movie that you had seen the bad one okay um and it's it doesn't have will smith in it no it doesn't have will smith and other than uh john cena's character peacemaker and some of the support people who came over from the back room of suicide squad like people that worked for uh task force x Mm -hmm. um there's not a lot of carryover from suicide squad just the idea of uh criminal super characters being used for government black ops that okay. that part carries over and the movie it's uh that it really reminded me of even more than the suicide squad is an earlier james gunn film uh called super if you ever saw that with rain wilson no i didn't see it um which is kind of about a deranged guy that becomes a, a vigilante um and rain wilson from the office is is that guy <laughs> and he beats up criminals with a pipe wrench <laughs> and it's uh it's funny and uh, and sweet in in a way but also <laughs> it is brutally violent and okay. and over the top and peacemaker follows suit in in that same regard do you think you need to watch suicide squad in order to watch peacemaker no i think um everything that you need to know about suicide squad you already know from seeing the first movie oh, okay. and from flashbacks that you're shown in Peacemaker. And is this on Netflix or Amazon? Or HBO what? Max. Oh, okay. And I'll just say, this is a... I can see you will probably like it because it's stupid and violent and funny. <laughs> I Things don't, I like. Yeah, I don't think Carrie will like this show. It doesn't seem like something... That's not thinky. I mean... It gets thinky as time. It gets very emotional. John Cena really stretches his acting chops. Oh. Um, he's a very... Com- he gets to be a much more complicated character when he's the only one. So in- who is a better... Who's the best wrestler actor? John Cena, Dave Batista, or Dwayne Johnson? Ooh. Uh, I have a hard time saying anyone but Batista. Oh, yeah. Because I think because he- the other two are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the other two are wrong. I think um I think The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, is a hell of a movie star. He is. Um, he's not a dramatic actor. He's not a dramatic actor, and when he does dramatic acting, it doesn't quite work. I think John Cena watching this might be a better actor. Yeah, he's going places, man. Like there's some stuff where like he's getting really emotional and it's getting into like his his uh, traumatic childhood and stuff, nice. and I'm like 
man, John Cena's making me feel something. <laughs> I'm feeling real feelings. What's wrong? Yeah. I, and I can't, I could say Dave Bautista can get me to real feelings. And I don't, sure. I don't know that Dwayne Johnson's ever got me to a real feeling besides like a, yeah. Except for when he's <laughs> wanting to punch Vin Diesel. <laughs> right. Like <laughs> when he flexes and breaks his arm out of his cast, that's a cool moment, but it's not really <laughs> emotional. Yeah. <for laughs> sure. it's, it's just a fuck. Yeah. But okay. yeah, John Cena's he's going to a, a deep well in this uh in this show and I don't want to give too much away. They're they're a branch off of the Suicide Squad and they're going after targets that are called butterflies. Um and it doesn't get revealed what a butterfly is till the end of the third episode. Does it have to do with the butterfly effect? Mm, no. no. Okay. But I maybe they're like a chrysalis and they're gonna Yeah, it's a mystery. Marriage. Okay. It's a pretty uh, it's a pretty cool reveal when it finally gets revealed. Okay. But anyways, I've been super into Peacemaker, and it's, of all the kind of geeky shit that's on TV right now, it's the one that I don't know what's going to happen next, oh. and therefore I'm enjoying it the most. Maybe I'll check it out. Uh, I've heard, You're not the first one to say good things about it. Yeah, just judging by the things that you have liked, I can see this being up your alley. All right. Well... Call to action? Yeah. Subscribe to us on your favorite podcatcher, as well as YouTube, Spotify, and Audible. Don't forget to leave us a review, because now Spotify lets you rate things, Mm -hmm. and you can even type out a review on Audible. For YouTube, you're going to have to, yeah, you can go and straight up review us. Five star, this was amazeballs, Dave (laughs) is so charming, and Nick is so witty. uh yeah and so you can you could do all of that and then youtube you're gonna have to just uh subscribe and upvote us a five-star review costs you nothing but means everything to us I, it's like i never thought two guys would do a review of paranoid that's longer than the actual album by four times <laughs> oh, no, it's only three times <laughs> yeah you can find us on all social media platforms across the metaverse as deep dive the meta we are on facebook as long as they let us keep calling ourselves metaverse uh instagram ditto uh, but we're also on pinterest which no one likes and we don't like them well i guess this is really goodbye don't say goodbye say good journey 